Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Call the meeting to order. Ms. Thompson, I think you have the honor. I do. If we could all stink invocation first. I'm in a hurry. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about our soldiers. So. Extra tall cup of coffee this morning. No, right, y'all, in about five minutes, we'll be speaking tongues. I'm just going to let you know. So let's all bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful to be here and be with my fellow commissioners and these fine folks in this meeting. I pray that you will give us all discernment, patience, calmness, and just let us all always focus on what is important to you and to what is important to our county. Bless this day and just help us to be the leaders that you want us to be. In your precious name I pray, amen. Now let's stand for prayer. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion on the agenda. And if you would, please, sir. Uh, we have a, a request to, to remove item 8A from the agenda. Uh, the via representative is, at, is sick this morning. And we've had a request to move item 8E for the uh, uh, chamber into the first place. So we'll be substituting, I, uh, my motion is to substitute item 8E for item 8A and eliminate item 8A. And I'll second that motion. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve the agenda as amended. I'll second that motion. Any further comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. I'm not going to try to pronounce this lady's last name, but if you will, someone, Ms. York. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to appear and pronounce your last name, please. Yes, sir. It's Bettina Akukwe. Thank you. <laughs> I knew I'd mess it up. <laughs> Don't worry about it, please. Thank you. Um, today, we have the privilege and honor of having a proclamation regarding the National Apprenticeship Week. Um, I'm going to ask you to read this. Okay. Elements County Board of Commissioners. And go to the microphone, please. Elements County Board of Commissioners Proclamation National Apprenticeship Week, November 13th, 2023 to November 19th, 2023. Whereas National Apprenticeship Week is celebrating its ninth anniversary of raising awareness of the vital role registered apprenticeships provide in creating opportunities by allowing apprentices to earn while they learn and prepare a pathway to good quality jobs and well-paying careers in Alamance County and across the nation. And whereas registered apprenticeship programs enable employers to develop and train their future workforce while offering career seekers affordable paths to secure high paying jobs. And whereas Alamance County recognizes the role of registered apprenticeship in expanding opportunities in our workforce that are inclusive of individuals who have been historically underserved, marginalized and adversely affected 
affected by persistent poverty and inequality, thus providing a path for all qualified individuals, including women, youth, people of color, rural communities, justice-involved individuals, and individuals with disabilities to become apprentices and contribute to America's industries. And whereas Alamance County recognizes that a registered apprenticeship, a proven and industry-driven training model is a key strategy to improving job quality and creating access to good-paying, family-sustaining jobs for all, starting with youth and young adults while addressing some of our nation's pressing workforce challenges, such as rebuilding our country's infrastructure, addressing critical supply chain demands, supporting a clean energy workforce, modernizing our cybersecurity response, and responding to care economy issues. And now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim November 13th, 2023, through November 19th, 2023, as National Apprenticeship Week in Alamance County. I want to thank you all for signing this proclamation. And it's previously been signed by me, sir, and by uh, our clerk. And we appreciate your being here. Thank you. In law offices, we call them interns. <laughs> of apprentices. Yes. So, and we use them a lot. Um, and their background does not make that much difference, but what they accomplish and achieve is tremendous. It is, it is. And I just want to note, on a side note, that we have over 50 employers in Elements County participating in apprenticeships. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And that is your copy. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, Mr. Joyce, you are our only speaker. Yeah, I didn't mean that. That's getting to be normal. <laughs> uh, I got three minutes, so I'm going to have to go fast, okay? <laughs> because I can't take this, what happened in five years, in three minutes, but I'm going to do my best. Okay, this is concerning what you made a decision on at your last meeting, uh, the bond referendum. Okay, in 2000, in January of 2019, ACC came to the school, came to the commissioners and said that they needed $10.4 million, okay, to build a training facility. It was supposed to be for law enforcement, fire service, EMS training, an indoor firing range, and a driving course. $10.4 million. Okay? The, 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 this thing was supposed to be done by 2022. Okay? Uh, the inflation rate in 2020 was 1.4. Inflation rate in March 2021, which was when they were supposed to dig ground, was 1.7. So it totaled with interest, and interest is probably a little high because these bonds are sold in increments, one, two, three, four, five years. So with the total of $10.2 million and the interest at 20 years would be $13,104,000, okay? Now, let's go to when it actually happened. The bond issuance on October 31st was $15 million at four and a quarter percent interest. The bond issue, if you did it when they said you were going to do it, was one and a third. Okay, so the, the interest rate's three times as high. The premium received from ACC in 2021 was $3,000,000 at 1.3%. The capital reserves that you said you were going to take in the last meeting from ACC was $3,500,000. The state gave you $5,000,000 for the shooting range which was already included in the first presentation, there was no state money. The board, uh, the, 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 the coupon rate is 4% plus you played a quarter percent because you'd taken premium again. So the total cost was $38,300,000 now versus, versus $13,104,000. Look, we don't, the America doesn't reward failure, okay? This is a failure on the part of the president of community college, a failure on the part of the board of trustees, and a failure on the part of the county commissioners for approving something like this. This should have been put off. I know it's done, but it should, we're going to let the public know that this should have been put off. It should have been held, stopped. It was a want. It wasn't a need. If it had been a need, it would have been done five years ago. 
and this has got to stop, and this just keeps happening. This is a 100%, in my opinion, a political decision. It has nothing to do with a need or a want. A need is something you've got to have right now. A want is something you wish list. And this has got to stop, guys. We just keep doing this over and over again. And it's, it's, this is totally a political decision. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Next is the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. second. Is there any comment concerning the consent agenda? I see thinking going on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do have one question on my consent agenda, and I think it's pretty easy to answer. Uh, the, uh, the, um, it, it's about the um, Chamber of Commerce. Um, I know we're about to um, reissue another contract with them, and I could not find what we were actually, um, what, what that payment was. I think it's 125000 but I could not find it. Is the amount of our annual contract mm -hmm. with them? What item? What number is that? I'm not seeing that. Six B. Six B. Correct. Oh, that's a different. It's just a clarification. Yeah, this not... is a different agreement than okay. annual one twenty five. That's why. I so this is find. for our workforce development collaboration that we uh, get funding from the state. Mm -hmm. And then it's uh, administered through ACC, through the Workforce Development Initiative. Perfect. And the amount um, on this one, I actually don't see that. 875000 is what staff is saying. I'm sorry, I just pulled up the summary sheet. And we have spoke about this before, haven't we? About this, is it connected to the survey? So this was a state appropriation. And there is no local received. match. Right. right. No worries. This just extends the life of that contract. Thank you very much. I just couldn't find the numbers. That's why I ask about it. Thank you very Thank much. You. And I'm good. good question. I couldn't find Thank it either you. right now. No worries. Thank you very much for your help. Any other comments? All in favor of the consent agenda, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Okay. We now have a public hearing. <coughs> Do we have a motion to enter the public hearing? This is to uh, public hearing proposed for the amendment of the uh, UDO or the Unif Uniform Development Ordinance related to planning, the planning board and the board of adjustment. Um, so moved. Ms. Ms. York. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'd be happy to second. introduce the item. We have a yeah. motion and a second. Uh, prior to the vote, do you want to say anything regarding this matter? I'd be happy to introduce the item, tell you a little bit about why we have this before you, and then if you'll want to conduct the public hearing, um, hear from anyone who signed up to speak, close the public hearing, and then it'll come back before the board for a decision. Are you ready for Please. me to introduce yes. it? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've discussed this a little bit. This is an opportunity for us to make some changes uh, related to your planning board and your board of adjustment. And the process in which to do that is to uh, adopt a text amendment to the Uniform Development Ordinance. So that would be to change the size of the current planning board. You know that's 13 members right now. And then we're also asking that you would consider to appoint a special separate board of adjustment. Right now the board of commissioners serves as a board of adjustment and best practices, um, consulting with other places and school of government suggests that some of the types of decisions that a board of adjustment makes could potentially be in conflict with the role of commissioner and constituents. So it's a quasi-judicial process that the board of adjustment works through. They consider variances. Uh, and we think that as we continue to grow and our planning needs continue uh, to expand, that there are going to be increased demands for this Board of Adjustment to have more and more hearings. So we have a unique opportunity right now. We have in our current planning board there, are, as I mentioned, 13 members. Five of the members' terms are expiring in December. And so that leaves a remaining seven members. So we would like for you to consider 
a text amendment that would reduce the size of the planning board down to seven members and for you to consider appointing and you don't have to make the appointments today but consider moving the other five previous planning board members to sit as your first separate board of adjustment they would be the ones who would um, consider the variances and would would handle the quasi-judicial nature of those needs so that's what's before you today. Happy to walk through uh, the various amendments uh, within the Uniform Development Ordinance or, or just give Before you the highlights. Before you do that, of those. let's uh, want to acknowledge our new planning director is present. Yes. Matthew, would you please stand and tell everyone who you are? Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman Paisley. Uh, so, for those of you that I haven't met yet, my name is Matthew Hoagland. I've been in the job now for a month and a day. I uh, started in early October, and I'm, I'm truly honored to be here. I live in Caswell County, and I served as Caswell County's planning director for the past five years. But again, truly honored to be an Alamance County employee and certainly happy to answer any technical questions you might have about this matter. Okay, Lord, I want to suggest that we um, open the public hearing at this point, um, and then... Uh, Ms. York will get further explanation afterwards, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, do I have a motion to open the public hearing? Motion to open the public hearing. Second. And a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed? It's unanimous. We are now in the public hearing. Is there anyone on this side that would like to have any comments pertaining to this change? Anyone on this side? Do we have anybody on Zoom that are that's contacted us? Do we have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Motion second. All in favor of closing the public hearing, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Okay, we're out of the public hearing. Um, at this point, um, this item is 7A. You have that in your packet. Uh, you have actually what the changes and so forth would be and their outline in that packet. Mm -hmm. For those of you that don't have packets, um, they're always available online, uh, usually by the preceding Thursday of our meetings. And this was likewise posted. So you, everybody that wanted to see it could have and hopefully has seen it. Um, okay, Ms. York, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, please. Okay, thanks. Um, as you mentioned in your packet, I have a memo from your planning director. He has um, previewed this with the current planning board members so they are aware that you are considering this change and they seem favorable to those that are in expired terms to moving to lead the new board of adjustment. And then following that are the proposed amendments that we'd like your consideration on. They're in a strike through version so that you're able to see exactly what uh, language changes we're asking you to make this morning. And I do have one clarification that I wanted to um, also squeeze in there if it's not too much trouble. Um, on page four of six of that document under section 2.3.3 procedures, we left out out of section A, uh, it's talking about uh, what um, necessitates a quorum, and we forgot to say in accordance with general statute. So it's right in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, the sentence starts with, for the purposes of this subsection, vacant positions on the board and members who are disqualified from voting on a quasi-judicial matter should say in accordance with general statute 160D-109D. So if we could insert that as one of the amendments. Um, happy to talk through this in more detail, but I think you've got the gist of it in terms of what we're looking to, to do. The reduction of the planning board down to seven members and the creation of the separate board of adjustment. And I would indicate that um, I'm a quasi-judicial member of the planning board, meaning that I attend all the meetings, but I don't get to vote. Yeah, ex officio, <laughs> ex officio member. I'm sorry, thank you. Um, and so consequently, uh, it was mentioned and brought up and discussed 
in the last uh, planning board meeting, we heard zero objections or concerns from any of the then existing 13 members on the planning board. Mm -hmm. In fact, the chairman and a couple of the others uh, were very appreciative and, and praised and we're looking forward to this change. Um, even the ones going off, because I think at least one or more want to be uh, placed on the new board, and that would be a consideration that we commissioners would have in the future. I don't think we need to do that today, um, but that would be something that we would do in the near future. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So once we have the text amendments adopted today, we would ask that you would just direct staff to advertise for the vacant positions, and then we would bring that back to you at a future meeting to make the official appointments to the Board of Adjustment, as well as the Planning Board, if there are any changes that you'd like to make, then you certainly have that opportunity. Right. But I do understand that the seven non-expiring members will continue on as the continuation of the seven-member planning board. That is our understanding, although you are, of course, able to appoint somebody different should the board choose to do so. <coughs> have you got a, Matthew, do you have a list of the uh, seven members that will be remaining? I have, I have that list. Um, All right. We've actually had a couple other folks drop off for reasons of attrition right. related to their terms expiring. So we're actually down to five people <coughs> remaining. Um, the, the folks with the remaining time on the terms are Anthony Pierce, Bill Poe, Troy Willoughby, Stephen Dotson, and Ernest Baer. All right. And you've got a couple of members, at least you and Dobie has moved. Right. So that's why he's not being uh, continued. Mm -hmm. And who was the seventh member? Oh. <laughs> what, a, what a quiz you're providing me with today. Um, it's Rodney Cheek, not so long. You're Rodney and Ray. Ray so Rodney's term is expiring. He would be eligible for reappointment. Okay. But these are the folks that still have time on their terms. Down to five. So there are a number of folks, uh, Amy Perkins, Sandy Ellington Graves, Blake Cobb, are, their terms are expiring, but they are eligible for reappointment this year. <clears throat> board, we need to uh, I would suggest we pass this as our new uh, procedure, setting up both the new board and this uh, reduction in numbers for this board. But I'm going to suggest that we not appoint either the existing seven members and or the new adjustment board until our next meeting. That'll give us time to look at all the names and consider them and then decide what we choose to do. Um, and I'll make a motion to that effect. Second. And we don't have a request to appoint them anyway, so. Right, we would like the opportunity to advertise for those positions, right. which is your, gen your standard procedure. And then will probably be December by the time we're able to get the applications and bring back those uh, candidates for you. Then I will amend my motion so, to the meeting or one of the meetings in December for consideration of those appointments as opposed to our next meeting in November. Okay. Mr. Carter. I'll amend you... my second. Thank you. Just, excuse me, just a quick yeah. question. What brought all this to mind? What was the reason well, behind the change? I think there have been some challenges having 13 members in terms of achieving a quorum and the logistics of, of trying to have everybody be heard at those meetings. They've gone on pretty lengthy. And so we started looking at other counties and the sizes of theirs, and we didn't have other counties with 13-member planning boards. So we were kind of an anomaly out there. So then when we had five members who were going, uh, whose terms were, were about to be up, we thought, well, this is a great time to at least look at this and consider if this is a change that the Board of Commissioners would like to make. So we're hoping it'll improve some efficiency, and we also wanted to take the opportunity to create this separate board of adjustment um, as a best practice to let the commissioners not perform that quasi-judicial function. Do well. other counties not, commissioners not perform that? Correct. Other counties have a separate board of adjustment. I'm not saying we have to be like anybody else. I'm just comparing. To sure. Okay. So there would still be ex officio member of the county commissioners on both 
the uh, planning board and board of adjustment. And when we bring back the recommendations for appointment, um, you would also could consider uh, appointing alternates on that board of adjustment because you do have to have all of those members present in order for them to take action. And I likewise have seen that during the planning board meetings and particularly the challenge with 13 members having a quorum. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of this. Does the planning board director have any comments? Yeah, Matthew, do you have anything? <laughs> I think the county manager summed it up perfectly. Um, uh, just w again, with regards to creating an independent board of adjustment, you know, quasi judicial decision making is obviously very separate from legislative decision making. So, the vast, vast majority of counties and municipalities throughout North Carolina have that independent board of adjustment, which is separate from the governing board. Yes, sir. A couple of requirement, uh, questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't have any problems with this in, in principle. I have some questions about the particulars. Um, so first of all, make sure my understanding is correct. The planning board is an advisory board that provides advice to the county commissioners to make a decision, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Uh, a, a, a board of adjustment actually affects citizens' rights. That is correct. Rights to develop property if for a variance. Those decisions don't get appealed to us, but to Superior Court. Correct. Right. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I understand this proposal creates three alternates for the Board of Adjustment. I, I don't, so a five-member board with three alternates, I don't quite understand the need for, for, for alternates for, an, and I just want to understand that better. Okay, Matthew, do you want to address that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you don't mind coming up to the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. So, um, Really, in essence, you can think of a board of adjustment almost as a, a jury, the way that a jury sits. And they uh, hear these types of quasi-judicial cases and have to decide uh, uh, based on an evidentiary hearing and the black and white nature of the facts before them. Let's say that you have a board member with a fixed opinion on the issue, or they may be the next door neighbor of a, uh, someone who is petitioning for a variance or an appeal. And so they have been exposed to uh, facts and evidence related to the property or they have a fixed opinion about their neighbor, they would need to recuse themselves from that vote. And so in that instance, an alternate would step in. So you have a five member uh, board of adjustment, you may appoint up to five alternate members. Obviously a situation in which you would have five recusals and then a need for five alternates would be exceedingly rare. So uh, it's really at the board's discretion. You could do two, three, four, five alternates. Uh, the alternates really just come in in those extenuating circumstances when you have a conflict of interest or a, a, a regular board member has to recuse themselves for any reason. And who determines when to pull an alternate in? That's an excellent question. So ideally, when the issues come before the Board of Adjustment and the agenda packets go out and the facts of the case are presented to both the petitioner and to the board, uh, the board member may raise their own hand and say, I have prior knowledge or a fixed opinion on this issue, and so I'm going to recuse myself. You also have the opportunity where the board of the other Board of Adjustment members can bring that up at the meeting and say, hey, you know, Bob, weren't you involved in this development 10, 15, whatever years ago? Uh, do you have, uh, do you feel like you have a conflict of interest? So the other board members can bring that up as well and uh, vote on the conflict of interest, have that member recuse, and then the alternate would step in. Um, which I think is a fine process. My, my concern about having, and, and I think there's probably a need for, for an alternate for, for conflict of interest purposes, mm -hmm. but my concern about having more than one is that the choice of which alternate to bring in could be outcome determinative. Yeah. Uh, just like in jury selection, I mean, yeah, there are certain people I want on the jury and certain <laughs> people I don't. Uh, that, that could come into play, and so that's my concern sure. about, about having a ton of alternates or even really even more than one. Yes, sir. Yeah, and I think that's a valid concern. I would imagine that in a situation like that, probably the best case would be to address that in the Board of Adjustments bylaws, where maybe the alternates are assigned a number. And so, um, you know, it just runs in turn. So the first need for a vacancy or the first need for a, a substitution would be alternate one, regardless of the case. And then once alternate one has had their turn, alternate two goes in, for example. So I think it's an excellent point, and I think as uh, the board constructs those bylaws, we can just be careful about uh, outlining that process so we have a, a wise delegation of when the alternates are needed. 
it, I'm not seeing it naming three alternates. I think the language is just reading may appoint alternate members to serve on the board of adjustment. I thought I saw three in the I think the section before that is talking about their terms three of year three terms. years. Okay. But the alternates is left vague enough to give you discretion in terms of how many alternate members you'd like to have available. Will the Board of Commissioners approve their bylaws? Uh, the uh, so yeah. yes, yeah. ultimately yeah. yes, yeah. Um, all right. My my other concern is um, going from thirteen to seven is pretty significant cut. Um, you know, thirteen may be a bit unwieldy, but it also allows more input. Uh, so I'm wondering if some number between the thirteen and seven might be more appropriate. Is it, have we given any thought to a different number? Yeah, in your in the memo, you can see some of the other counties that we looked at. Um, we chose to highlight the counties that were comparable to Alamance in terms of population, not having countywide zoning similar to us, and or were geographically uh, adjacent to us or nearby. And so there are some other um, sizes there. Seven worked well for us because we had five who were going off. So we thought it, it took away some of the opportunity for potential conflict there um, with those terms. But certainly if the board would like to choose a different size board, you could. Thank you. Just a question, and it's just my opinion. Um, so this whenever we've had all these hearings and all this all this stuff before, we've always had folks to call us to tell us what's going on because we work for them. We're elected to be their voice. Is this removing us from this whole process? We haven't had a lot of quasi-judicial hearings with this board. So that's something different. That's okay. when you're not allowed to have communication okay. uh, on an item with constituents at all. You're not okay. allowed to be swayed one way or another. So we've not done a lot of those type of hearings. We just haven't had requests for variances, but we do feel like that's okay. coming soon. So in terms of other public hearings, it would be absolutely appropriate that you're having those types of communications from citizens and could consider. But when you have a quasi-judicial that is not allowed to have constituent input. Okay. And if, if there's ever zoning before I die in my mid-90s, <laughs> is this going to change this procedure? Will that affect that whatsoever? You would still have okay. a board of adjustment and a planning board, and all matters would still go through the same okay. Okay. Uni uniform development Sounds ordinance good. guidelines. Just to be clear, the board of adjustment, the whole point of it is to hear requests for variance based on the regulations we already have in place. So the board's role is to set the regulations, and the Board of Adjustment is actually the one that would hear individuals who might think that their property qualifies for a variance based on the rules that you guys set. So that's why there's kind of a two-part process. The board wouldn't lose any authority to develop those regulations. These are just the requests for people that think, hey, my property's different, or I need an exception to the rule. Okay. Yeah. Just when people are watching and they may not be schooled in this and they right. may not know anything about it, I just think it's really important that we over explain it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, because I don't ever want anybody to ever lose their, their voice because I'm seeing that happen across my country a lot. And I don't want that to happen in this county. Right. You guys still set the rules. This board is just the one that decides okay. when somebody qualifies for an exception to the rule. Okay. Just yeah. checking. Just yeah. checking. Okay. I'm good. Welcome. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Mr. Lashley. I have no questions. I don't have any more questions. Mr. Turner, any other questions? No, thank you. The reason I like this Board of Adjustment particularly is typically, Ms. Thompson, when they make the call, the citizen makes the call to us, we're so deep into it that we've already disqualified ourselves uh, because we have information that we would have otherwise had to make a decision upon. Um, and we don't realize that entering the conversation. So I think this helps us as commissioners, but also helps the population. Any other comments? I'm going to ask that we approve this procedure 
uh, an adjustment and the addition of adding the Board of Adjustment has presented to us. Um, Mr. Turner, do you want to make an adjustment as to the number of members? I could, I could accept nine. I'm good with that. And I, I'm good with one alternative, one alternate. No more. I could support that. Because what you said is exactly what would happen. Yeah. <laughs> Let me remind you that at this point, you can only have two appointees on either board uh, from one precinct, and I think that's a, a positive. Um, but we have, what is it, 32 precincts now? Is that some? 38. 38, whatever it is, a large number. Um, this is actually based on the township, township. not the right. precinct. Right. Township, right. Oh, township. Thank you. Yeah. And how many townships do we have? 13. 13. 13. Yeah. I'm sorry. 13, 13. One, which three. was, I think, the original the logic why. of the 13 members. Yeah. One from each? I think that was it, what the intention was, and that is not what well, that's, was played out. Gotcha. That's not totally straight up, I think. Correct oh, me if I'm I wrong. So 13 in the county. But you have many, many more in municipalities. Um, so I think it's something like, it's a much larger number than that. Uh, and there, you can be in a city and still be on one of these boards. So I think that's what you're talking about. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's right. I think there's 13 townships that are uh, wholly or largely in the county and not inside a municipal area. Correct. And that seems to represent most of the representation that we get on the planning board, right? People get on the county planning board because they want to influence the development of the county outside of municipalities. So that's been where we've been. And I think the policy has been no more than two from one township, but it's not required that there be one for each township. That's that correct. Sense. That is correct. Yes. Yeah. If we go with one alternate, if we limit it to one alternate, would that alternate then have to be from a separate township from the other members of the board? I think we're blending two things. So the alternate's going to be on the board of adjustment. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. We're talking about planning board has a requirement at this point that there be no more than two per township. Yeah. So in the board of adjustments, board of adjustments does doesn't have a requirement for location? It does not. It does not. Okay. At this point. Mr. Chairman, would you amend your motion for... Uh, for nine members of the planning board and one alternate member of the board of adjustment. I would do that, Mr. Carter. You, I think you made the second. Yeah, I'm okay with that. All right. So currently, it's as presented, except it would be nine members of the planning board and one alternate to the board of adjustment. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So five members of the board of adjustments with one alternate. Correct. Mr. Chairman, I think we've got a question. I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt. I just want to make one, one other um, technical comment regarding alternates and, and the operations of the Board of Adjustment. So the Board of Adjustment hears variances in addition to appeals and other quasi-judicial issues. State law requires with a variance, the burden of, of proof is, is more extensive than a traditional a standard issue. So it actually requires a four-fifths majority of the Board of Adjustment. So. Obviously, the discretion for alternates is up to the Board of Commissioners, but if you did have a situation where you had recusals and your alternate came in and maybe you only had one and for whatever reason you had a four-member body hearing a variance, then the burden would be a unanimous vote in that four-person instance as opposed to a four-fifths vote if you had a full complement of board members. So just, just a little additional information on that one. Yeah, that, that's, I think that, that, that's what was giving me a little bit of heartburn over trying to limit it to one alternate. Um, you get yourself in a position where you may not have enough people to show up to have the vote. I'd, 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 I'd make a suggestion we amend that to at least two alternates. Mr. Turner, uh, can we... We're not interested. <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon? I'm not interested in, one, in two alternates. I'm just interested in one. And if it's four-fifths, you've got to have the majority. My question would be, in that scenario that you laid out, could the uh, Board of Adjustment say, we don't have enough people to make this vote, can you come back the next time and let's take it up then? Yes, sir. If, if for whatever reason the board can't conduct its business, then obviously the agenda items would just move to the Four. next month's okay. meeting. 
Thank you. As a compromise, may I suggest that we have a alternate one and alternate two and designate them as one and two with the authority going first to alternate one as opposed to alternate two. Um, it takes three votes, so we don't have to have an agreement, but I would love to have an agreement on this. <coughs> Mr. Lashley, would you consider such? Well, I'm, what I'm trying to do is what Mr. Turner laid out is, is what I think would happen is you would get outcome-based person chosen to be the alternate on this particular case. With just one alternate, there's none, there's none, of, there's none of that. There's none of that. Everybody knows who it is. It can't be changed. And if you got two, you're right back to what Mr. Commissioner Turner was saying, that what could possibly occur in these places where, hey, they just handpick the person who's going to support their idea. With the one alternate, it's pretty much cut and dry. Let me ask Ms. Stevens as our legal attorney, um, if we designate one, alternate A1, alternate one, with priority, then alternate one would have to have a conflict in order to go to alternate two. Is that correct? Um, based on the way you're describing it, I think that's correct. And, and based on Mr. Lashley's question about being able to move the item, that would certainly solve a situation where there's only so many board members available because of some conflict of schedule. Um, that wouldn't necessarily solve a problem of a conflict of interest. So if you had multiple members of the board, let's say two members of a five-member board that are conflicted out because they live on either side of the person requesting a variance, and now you only have four possible members, then Mr. Hoagland's point is well made. You now have a situation where you have four people sitting to hear the item, and the burden is on the appellant to say that, hey, I've got to get all four of these people to side with me. Um, and that, that's a big burden. Uh, ordinarily, you'd have the ability to have at least one person vote uh, in the alternate and still be successful. So having a unanimous vote might be a difficult burden. So I, I can see the logic of having more than one. I think Mr. Turner's point is well made. Uh, but if there is a schedule and we know that, hey, alternate one is up for these months of the year or they're up first until they hear something and then they rotate out, I think that might fix the conflict. Additionally, um, not just being a neighbor, but that alternate may have been lobbied and already have made up his or her mind in advance and therefore not eligible to make the decision. That's right. Correct. Yeah. And there's going to be a lot of, I don't want to say coaching, but coaching on the front end of, with this new board because they're going to be sitting and hearing these things dispassionately. They don't have the ability to be moved by what they ordinarily think about an issue or what somebody's told them about an issue, they have to consider the facts presented to them at the hearing, just like a judge and a jury would consider those facts. But it's a little different than how we normally do business. We want to make sure they're coached on that up front. Did you have all these issues and burdens and lobbying and stuff before you thought about these five people? I'm just curious. <laughs> Alternates have just shot us to the moon. I mean, um, never mind. It's just get conflict. We can't, and these five know that they can have no feelings whatsoever. We don't know who they are yet. <laughs> we're going to be. <laughs> we're going to be working with. Are them. they going to be from the United States of America? <laughs> they must we'll reside in Alabama County. Yeah. Good luck with your feelings. And uh, I guess my question would be: How are you going to go about choosing these folks? Is it going to be an application process? <laughs> yes. Right. So and the, we, the commissioners, approve. Yeah, approved. your rules of procedure require advertising and appointment by the board. So yeah. we will bring that back at a future meeting. You can choose the alternates then. You don't have to even choose the number right now because the way that it's in the text amendment right now is just the possibility of alternate. Okay. So I have some time to think about you have some time. thinking and bring, bringing like, a second alternate. Unless you'd like to specifically... Now, will, will we be able to choose the alternates, or the Board of Adjustments choose the alternate? The Board of Commissioners would choose the alternate. Okay. So I have some time. My about this. Excuse me. I got a few. I got a what? The next. Unless next you meeting? want to specify a number, the way that we have proposed it, it does not specify a number of alternates. So we could move on if we're not ready to make that decision. Um, 
I'd like to like to think about this for a little bit. Sure. I, I'd, I'd like to run it through a, a crazy math scenario to see what options are. <laughs> <laughs> if that's okay with the board. So we could well. still have an adoption of the text amendments as written with the uh, exception of Commissioner Turner's change for uh, seven members going to nine members on the planning board. That would need to be amended um, in the vote to make these text amendments. Uh, and be I able think to my them. amended motion is for nine members, and the second agreed with that. So I think that's what is before us. Um, but we have we, one alternate. And so at this point, we have alternates, the S in paren, because it's not been determined. And we can determine that in the future. Is that correct? That is what I am recommending. Rick, are you okay with that? Yeah, the that language makes sense may to me. appoint alternate members. At a later time. And decide the number. So, so right now it's just nine members and we haven't put an alternate on there yet. There is no alternate for planning board. I'm sorry. Board of, board of adjustment would be five sorry. members with an undisclosed amount of alternates. Understood. <laughs> Apologize for the confusion. <laughs> yep. <laughs> just wanting to make sure we're all on the same page. <laughs> Any further discussion? <laughs> So we now have nine planning board members. We have five board of adjustment with one or more alternates to be determined in the future. I'll amend my second to that. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. very much. Thank you. And Matthew, I, Congratulations, I think. <laughs> <laughs> like a board of adjustment member, I am dispassionate about <laughs> But you were the first one to say 13. When he asked you about townships, you yes, said 13 first. That's, that's impressive. First, thing I learned about the uh, first day in here, that's good. Very nice. Okay, the next is the Chamber of Commerce. Commissioners, this is the quarterly report that's required based on the contract that we have with the Chamber for Economic Development Activities. So uh, Reagan is here to kick that off for us. Hi, good morning. Uh, Chair Paisley, Commissioners, it's a delight to be with you. I'm Reagan Grill, President and CEO of the Alamance Chamber, and we are continuously proud of the economic development services that we provide on behalf of Alamance County, ranging from small business and entrepreneurial development to existing industry to industrial recruitment to um, uh, workforce development. It's always an honor to represent Alamance County. With that, I invite David Putnam, Senior Director of Economic Development with the Chamber, to come forward and share some of those updates with you. Good morning. Uh, good morning, good morning Commissioners. Really appreciate the opportunity to present before you all and the public of Alamance County. Um, so what I'd like to do is just kind of uh, go through what I expect the agenda to be and see if that's uh, acceptable to you all. So in the presentation, I'll cover five-year performance of industrial recruitment and expansion activities. Um, we'll discuss project activities uh, to date um, in this performance period of March 1st, 2023 to September 30, uh, 2023. Similarly, using that performance timeline, We'll look at inquiry needs and forecasts from interested uh, projects, as we would call them, and then finally uh, close it out with a product um, snapshot of Alamance County, product being what do we have available to market to these industrial expansion recruitment opportunities. So with that, we'll kick it off. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the list of the five-year performance um, based on the industries uh, that have announced their location expansion in Alamance County, in addition to chamber support uh, that helped them do that. Um, so you'll see a lot of similar names here. Um, as to last time, I think we closed out with Revere Copper and Lab 4 as the most recent announcements um, at the conclusion of last meeting. Now we've got two more um, exciting announcements, including Alliance MOCVD, uh, which I pronounce Alliance Mockvid. It's a little, rolls off the tongue a little bit better. And then Syntas, um, 
had a recent expansion in the city of Graham. Uh, that is publicly, they've announced that that's produced about 100 jobs. So um, we're very excited about that. Um, just quickly from this sheet, um, you know, one thing that's important to note is Honda Power Equipment is there listed up at the top as an expansion. That's still the case. They've gone through a name change. It's now Honda North Carolina Manufacturing, which is, you know, we feel like is an exciting name change that adapts and adopts the recent announcement they made of taking ATV production, uh, some ATV production from South Carolina and moving it to the facility here um, in uh, Swepsonville, which they've made a tremendous amount of investments in already. And that's a legacy project way outside the scope of five years. But to date, I think in an article they said that number has, amount, uh, has a, amounted to $380 million that they've invested in that facility. So that's a huge investment that's not captured on this. Um, it just shows the rippling benefit uh, of these types of projects and what we announced, the induced, the indirect benefits, because um, what you're seeing before you is just, just the direct benefits um, of these project announcements. Another thing I'd like to highlight is overall this five-year performance amounts to $739,500,000 uh, of capital investment and 1,445 jobs for Alamance County. So another big um, uh, metric across those 10 recruitment projects and nine expansion projects. I'm gonna brag a little bit about Alliance Mockvid. This is a very cool um, company that decided to locate two Central Carolina Industrial Center in Mebane, North Carolina. Um, their 2023 Power Partner Award, and that's a, an award nominated by their customers. So it's very meaningful to receive that award. Um, and they're also a recently announced semiconductor foundry, which there's been a lot of talks about semiconductors in the United States and how are we diversifying our supply of semiconductors. Well, this is a great example of semiconductors in Alamance County. So what they do specifically is they design and manufacture film process equipment and specialize in metal organic chemical vapor deposition equipment, which is where the MOCVD acronym comes from. Uh, and they're a supplier of this equipment to vendors such as Wolf Speed, <coughs> vendors such as you know, Corvo, all these other different big players in the semiconductor space. So we feel strongly that they're a tremendous asset for Alamance County. All right. So moving on, um, it's a little difficult to see, um, but I can go through the numbers with you all. Um, so we have new active and site visit metrics across March to September of this year. Um, so you can see we were pretty generally looking at new project inquiries, that blue line um, pretty gradually, 12, 13, 12, 14, 11, 14. Well, we shot up in September uh, we think it's after the summer rush, people are starting to get back in the groove of things. We entertained about 31 project inquiries, which is a tremendous amount of volume. That's almost one inquiry every day that was interested in Alamance County. Um, now, some of those are statewide searches, but they were coming looking at Alamance County specifically, too. Excuse me, David. Is that yeah. Are we thinking that's tied to the announced expansion for the Toyota project? So it could be. Um, certainly we've seen some vendors that want to be near Toyota, want to be near VinFast, want to be near WolfSpeed, those types of projects. We've not seen the direct like supplier industries, right. the tier twos or threes, actually make landfall yet. So I think there's more of this volume to come. Wow. I think we'll continue to see this uptick. Um, truthfully, things that are holding folks back from investing um, and proceeding with their projects is there's a lot of uncertainty in the macro level of the economy, right? Like our interest rates going to go down, where is everything going to be at over the next few years? And that has caused some kind of stallments. Uh, also, some of these companies make decisions based off of um, it, federal legislation that they're waiting on guidance still from the Treasury. And so that can also cause a holdup in their decision making process. So. I think in terms of what's to come, we're going to continue to see this amount of volume um, probably over the next few years. What did you say about interest rates? 
uh, just in the event, are interest rates going to come down or are they going to continue to rise? Uh, because at the beginning of the year, we saw a lot of just project inquiries. They wanted to own their own land. They wanted to buy their own buildings. They didn't want to lease. Now, those dynamics are starting to shift. I think interest rates keep climbing. Folks are like, well, that's a lot of investment to just drop uh, with so much uncertainty. And so projects and companies are more interested in leasing right now and partnering with developers, more so than we saw earlier this year. Yeah. So you can also see that you know September was a busy month for us as well. We had seven site visits which, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into those site visits. Oftentimes we have the clients, the state representatives, the community college uh, representative that was just here before as a core partner of ours, um, and we're actively trying to recruit these projects as they come in, putting our best foot forward, showing them assets like the community college, things the commissioners have invested in and the greater Alamance County populace have invested in as a whole. So um, we had a, a, a good amount of activity for sure. And we're still entertaining a high number of active projects. Um, that number is not is likely not a seven right now. It's more so a six or a five. Um, we've not crunched our numbers quite yet. Uh, we use Salesforce as a, our tool for tracking these metrics. And since we just closed out October, we're looking to do that mid-November and updating that tool. How many sites do we have available now? That's a great question. <laughs> Um, so we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later, but okay. I will tell you we've got 24 sites and 24 buildings, and I'll give you kind of the, the macro lens of what that all means and where we stay in a statewide competitive structure. Um, so this, um, this slide really highlights project inquiry needs and forecasts. And so all those projects that I, that blue line that I mentioned before, the new inquiries that we had, um, we'll solicit those leads from maybe it's the state, maybe it's some existing industry services that we provide, like site visits, um, a number of different leads that we generate. Well, of all those leads that we've generated, um, they came back with a forecasted projection of 31,339 jobs that they're looking at investing in Alamance County, and 23889000000 million $95,000 worth of capital investment. Now again, some of these project inquiries were statewide, right, um, and they were really specific to a certain type of product. Sometimes Alamance County didn't have that product to be able to offer them, so inherently we would miss out, but we're still going to respond. It's your job to uh, confirm or deny <coughs> the investment of projects in Alamance County. It's not our job, so we try and respond as frequently as possible to these projects so that we can give you all the opportunity to do that. Um, but obviously sometimes we get looked over because the product doesn't meet or the shoe doesn't meet the foot that they have, right? <laughs> so, you know, I, we've had project needs that have come in for a thousand acres. And right now, Alamance County, we don't have a single site that complements a thousand acres. So we're going to miss out on that project, right? Uh, but, of course, all of the needs from that performance period, March to September, um, you'll see a macro level of need of around 4,494 acres, and then that's across close to 20, 000, uh, 20 million excuse me, square feet of industrial space that they were looking for. Now, this is a product development slide or a snapshot slide of what type of product we have currently in Alamance County, um, and we work with the state to make sure that this is, well, I say the state, our, when I reference the state, our core partner is the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina. Their acronym is EDPNC, um, and they're a private um, partnership institution that has an assemblage of state recruiters, site selector uh, relationships, existing industry service providers, a whole bunch of different services. So we actively work to maintain our own property database that we can submit to projects for them to consider in Alamance County. And this is a snapshot of the Alamance County outline for those. So you can see of the active properties that we do have, um, there's a total square feet of 3,525,719. And so that is 
product that's you know been proposed we've got building plans or some other plans for them and we feel like the, that's gonna either come online or is online right now and when I say online <coughs> I mean people can move in or we see the structure going up or it could just be plans on paper that have maybe a 12 to 18 month uh, build time but we have to be able to market those effectively to these projects in order for them to consider them so you see some duplication some buildings are also sites and that's why you sometimes have total amount of acreage as 1,470 acres is because there is a duplication, right? Um, but among all of that, we've got 24 buildings and 24 sites, which is a good amount of product in Alamance County. You can see they're concentrated in areas that we would traditionally qualify as employment kind of zones, generally where uh, we're pushing industries. Um, and how we stack with that number of project needs you know, we are still oversubscribed, but I feel like we are faring well compared to some of our statewide competitors and national competitors for that matter. So that was a whirlwind of information, but I'm happy to take any questions or clarify anything that I've said uh, during my presentation. Mr. Putnam, you mentioned we don't have the thousand acre spot for mega development. Do you know what our single largest track is? So we have um, some tracks a uh, little south of the airport that are around 200 acres. Okay. How many? 200. Is that in close proximity to the Stairtech yeah. site? Very close proximity to the uh, Stairtech site. Um, these sites are ones that have undergone other forms of due diligence. You know, they've had phase ones. They've had phase twos. They're being marketed, but there's, you know, it... it they may face terrain difficulties, <coughs> things like that. Um, so it might be a 200-acre site. It's hilly. What's that? It's the topography is hilly. Yeah, or it might have some wetlands. yeah wetlands or rivers running through it and okay. stuff. So it could be a 200-acre site, but you might only be able to fit a handful of 100,000 um, square foot buildings on it, right? So, but it's, we still have some nice-sized sites. And just as kind of a point of interest, too, uh, I have a friend on the Board of Commissioners in Randolph County, and he was telling me that with the, uh, with the initial announcement from Toyota, before the most recent bump from $6 billion to $14 billion, they were going to be able to seriously look at a significant inc decrease in the property tax rate because of the potential increase in tax revenue that would be coming from the Toyota operation. So that kind of an the potential for that kind of an increase here is actually larger if you looked at the total of the interest than what they have with Toyota. Now we obviously don't have capacity for the all for all 31 of those visits, but um, it would be a real and the other piece of that too is you said not only a significant decrease in the property tax rate, but also an increase in their fund balance, which improves their bond rating. So. Those are all things that would be beneficial to the citizens of Alamance County if we could recruit some of these large operations into the county. And if I can add a little note to that as well. So the General Assembly passed their budget. Within that budget was um, an appropriation to the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina to look at site development, new product development, and even things um, not focused exclusively on a thousand plus acres but 500 acres 200 acres 100 acres diversifying that product pipeline because you know we know that it's great to have a 1,000 acre site and recruit a Toyota but is that a fit for every community the answer is no right right and so we want to be strategic with the product that we're turning online we want to be mindful that it's going to speak to the Alamance County's needs and you guys are in the position to do that which is why our partnership with you all is so great. And I'll add that that one site at the um, base just below Saxpaw, that's really a commercial property. So we do have some commercial listings on this as well. Um, but that property is in Eli Whitney. It's maybe two acres. So you can see a lot of the product that we have available that's being marketed is along that 4085 corridor. 
Um, mm-hmm. It's really not stretched beyond there. We have a saying in the industry that, you know, if you don't have any product, you don't have a project, and that speaks very true um, because we have a ton of land north and south of the interstate, but we don't have utilities hooking up to it, power hooking up to it, sewer, water, all those other things that really make a project so special, so or a property so special for industry uh, interest. And for future growth, that speaks to the need for a southern loop, infrastructure, transportation. Infrastructure is a huge part of a company's decision to locate somewhere. Just to throw this out there, you're talking about farms. <laughs> mm-hmm. you better be careful because we push so hard to preserve our farmlands and to work with people to keep that in, to keep that safe and. Um, Absolutely. Just you better watch it. That's yeah. what I'm going to say. That's why we don't have any of those types of properties that we're marketing because, you know, we're sensitive to that relationship yeah. as well. I yeah. hope so because we've been real sensitive to that with the PUV and everything else because yeah. um, they don't make land anymore. And um, I know generational farmers are kind of going away. A lot of our farmers are really retirement and older and they're kids have gone to college and they don't want to do that. They don't think they want to do that till years later. Yeah. And um, it's just very important that we have a balance here in Alamance County and we just don't, we're Alamance County. We are nobody else. Mm-hmm. And we don't need to be like anybody else. We just need to take care of our, our families here and have a real balance because um, sometimes you aren't so, you might get what you think you thought you wanted yeah. and it might not turn out to be that way. That's right. And and I'm not anti-growth at all. I, I like that zoning thing because I want to protect stuff. But at the same sense, I'm going to stand with that farmer. Yeah, and if I can brag a little bit, we recently hosted our economic summit, which is an event that we host annually mm-hmm. over at Elon University. And it its feature was agriculture, yeah. right? So that's one of the things we look at as economic development as well is agriculture and farming um, because it is so important. Right? Well, there's so many kids in this county, thank you, make milk at food line. And it's a real shame because they need to understand where it all comes. I'm not kidding. I'm, I am not kidding. And that's a real crime on us to not show our next generation of how it is and the reality of it because yeah. we see world hunger. And it's AI can't help us on that. So we'll see. It's huge. And we're laughing because that is such a true yeah. statement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I ain't had a, a tasty computer chip lately. So it's saying. <laughs> Quick, one more question, Mr. Putnam. Uh, a lot of underutilized, unutilized old textile mills in the county still, some of them being used for loss. But is there any interest in those spaces from, from some people you talk to? So not just building new, but reusing old. Yeah. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, there's a lot of interest in adaptive reuse, um, which would be converting those former textile mills that are dilapidated into something that's usable again. Um, Is that exclusively for industry use, like industrial or heavy industrial? No. So we've had a lot of interest in redeveloping those former mills into things like uh, multifamily housing, because we know housing is such a strain on um, Alamance County and the region and the state as a whole, right? Um, But we do still have some properties, like Copeland Mill is one of the featured properties, and that is still being advertised for industrial use. And so we're looking at ways on how can we reactivate what is already there because it's a tremendous asset to Alamance County. And it tells a story that, I mean, makes Alamance County, right? So it's meaningful to us. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? We thank you. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. All right, item 8B um, is now off, and we're sorry that Kara's under the weather. 8A. 8A. But was 8A, we moved it to 8B. 8A is moved, 8B is still on. 8B is good. 8B is still on, 8A is one. I understand. What was 8B? Still 8B. Because it's still 8 no. That was the uh, CARA's report on bio. So we're skipping that. Does that go to our next meeting? 
we'll, we'll coordinate with Kara to, to make sure that she's available for that meeting. But yes, right. it will be at a future meeting. So now we have the revised 8B or C. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, hey, Chairman. We know who you are, but would you state? Sure, absolutely. Uh, my name is Donald Drews. I am uh, with the Vice President of Behavioral Health and IDD Operations with Via Health. And I uh, always like to uh, be here in Alamance County and talk with you guys. As I was sitting back listening to uh, the chamber speak, I'm glad they got to go before me. I, I started thinking a lot about uh, the need to really continue to grow behavioral health um, supports in this county um, and the number of jobs that are being created. So I have to get with the chamber and talk with them around. We can talk about how many jobs we've been able to create in the county around behavioral health and human services and really meeting the need around that. It was roughly about two years ago uh, where we started uh, sitting down with the county and talking about what the county's needs are, where they see saw VIA stepping in and really supporting the county. And one of the, the foremost areas uh, that kept coming up in all of those meetings was the need for a crisis diversion center, a hub of support in the county to keep individuals with mental health, substance abuse, um, out of your jails, out of the emergency rooms, supporting them in their local communities and making sure they were getting connected with the right services and supports as opposed to going with unmet needs, uh, getting stuck in the uh, judicial system or lost completely um, across the system. So I'm here to give you an update on where we're at with that. You charged us with moving that project forward and I'm glad to say we are making progress. So. Uh, it's a picture of your uh, brand new crisis diversion center that's going up over on uh, Kilpatrick uh, Road. Uh, it's making lots of great progress. I think if you went over there today, I think they actually have the blacktop it down is. now. Um, so a little bit uh, more going on there. The outside shell of the building is completely done, as you can see. Uh, moving forward there, and really been focused on the internal upfit of the building. Um, and that's part of my presentation uh, today. So great progress on the building. Hope you're uh, liking what you see there. Uh, to remind you, uh, we're focusing on a couple of areas uh, in that facility. Uh, diversion from criminal justice system. We really want to have been working really closely with all the municipalities and law enforcement around making sure when this facility goes operational, we got business processes and systems in place where we can divert people from the judicial system into those facilities and getting connected to services. Uh, likewise, diversion um, from Alamance Regional Medical, talking with Cone Health around how they can make sure individuals access this facility as opposed to getting stuck in the emergency room. We're all horrified by the stories of an individual going in and needing help in an emergency room, and then three weeks later, they're still there, right? Sitting in an emergency room for three weeks is no place. Um, for your citizens or anyone else to recover when they have a mental health or they're dealing with addiction. And so getting them to the right place is critically important. Um, so again, EMT, another diversion site. Um, this is, diversion site is all about centralizing those services and supports. Uh, back in the old days, if you've been in the system as long as me, everyone remembers that every county had their own area authority. It was like your DSS, and everybody knew that was the building you went to uh, to get your services. And when we all went through mental health reform in the state of North Carolina, everyone really lost. Like, well, where is that office at? And provider move offices regularly, right? They may get better lease agreement down the road, so they may close an office and move somewhere else. And somebody may think, oh, go to there. That office may be closed. And so really needed to create a central hub for services. So no matter where providers go, no matter what services are in there, they really have um, a person that can direct people to the right services and supports um, across the system. So we want to increase access to care. We really want to make that a, a centralized hub. We really want to work on the preventative side. Most individuals don't immediately go into crisis, right? You don't go from um, feeling a little depressed to being suicidal. There's a continuum along there where you continue um, that if you can get support earlier in that process, you can prevent a lot of crises in your community. And so creating a place where we can not only provide the crisis support, but a place where we can address the pending crisis is critical across the system. And that means somebody knows where to go to get that support when they're starting to feel like they might be in crisis earlier in that process. 
A couple other things uh, that you're going to see with the expansion of this facility uh, in your community is the expansion of 24-hour access, meaning we need to move to greater access across the system. People don't go in the crisis, unfortunately, between uh, 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Uh, we wish they did and make life easier for all of us, but that doesn't happen. Um, so evenings, weekends, holidays, there's got to be a place uh, that can operate that on a 24-hour basis. Um, specialized services to where when people get there, there's services that actually can support them. Uh, we have lots of providers in your community, and they all do certain things really well. Um, but not everyone does everything. And so we need to create a place to where those specialized services can come to individuals versus everyone else having to go find where they need to go in the system. A peer living room model, you'll hear a little bit about that. That's really where people can drop in and get support from peers, right? You know, like you don't have to have an appointment or anything else. You can go to the peer living room. There's a fridge there. You can get you some water. You can sit down. You can get some materials. You can talk with someone and say, hey, you know, I'm not having the best of day today, um, and then you just need a little bit of support. So completely OBAX and uh, peer living room model, a pharmacy um, on the site to make sure. The number one issue for most people going into crisis, unfortunately, is they can't get their meds, right, or they ha don't have them. And so making sure they have timely access to medications, uh, critical to that. A be behavioral health urgent care where we can work with people to get people dispositioned because not everyone needs to be in a hospital setting. Not everyone needs to be um, in a certain facility. So to get some place where you can triage and you can evaluate and assess and actually figure out where they need to go is critical. And then lastly, uh, we'll be lifting a facility-based crisis center in the facility, which is a 16-bed residential facility where people can stay uh, for up to two weeks uh, in that facility to be detoxed, to deal with their crisis, to get stable uh, before they're released um, uh, with the community supports they need to be successful. So this is just a, a quick timeline that I threw in there. You have it in your packet. Uh, you can look at it um, as you go. Uh, but as you see there, we're, we're getting into that phase uh, through November and December here where we're uh, really just working on the upfit of the building. So if you went over and you toured the building today, you would see lots of plumbing and electrical and stuff going into the interior, getting ready to to get the walls up. We're waiting to, to get the elevator in the building. The elevator is uh, the, uh, the sore spot for us right now, <laughs> getting that elevator in the business, in the building so we can work around it. Unfortunately, you can't put an elevator in uh, later after you get everything done. You gotta get that elevator in there first. And so that's being worked on. But we're gonna really quickly getting to that um, finishing phase. And so you see as we get into the new year of 2024, we're going to be in that last, um, what I would call sprint run uh, to finish the facility. And we're going to be talking about operational components of the building, making sure that everyone's on board around um, what are we going to do for security in the building with law enforcement? Um, how is that going to work? One of the things we'll be coming back to commissioners are, what are we going to call this building? Um, what, you know, what's going to be the name of the facility? What's going to be a good name to put out there? Because we're going to market that all across the community. Uh, we'll probably put up some billboards um, in the community saying, hey, if you need help, this is where you need to go. So you want to make sure you get that naming down uh, so you can create the name because you don't want to create, put up billboards, put up a big sign on the building, put signs down the street, say, hey, if you're having a behavioral health crisis, please go here or a call here. You don't want to do all that work and then change the name six, you know, six weeks later because then you just got to rebrand everything all over. So that branding's important and so uh, we'll want to come back to the commissioners when we get ready for that. That's probably somewhere at the beginning of the year that we're going to need to really talk about what are we calling this building so we can get bids out on that signage. And that's one thing I'll be going into um, here in a little bit around the bidding process and kind of where we're at. So that was all the great news. Some of the, uh, the not so great news that we're working on is that um, like everything else, any other project uh, you probably experienced or people have spoke with you guys about, um, costs have continued to rise across the system. And so I'm glad to report that the shell of the building uh, when we first uh, moved forward on that, they were able to pre-purchase a lot of the equipment for the shell of the building. 
the exterior and all of that, and we came in exactly at our cost for that building, no increases at all in that. That was largely because we were able to move pretty quickly on the building, thanks to the commissioners and everything really green lighting that to move forward. So that was great. Um, unfortunately, as we moved to the upfit of the building, that's the interior components of the building, we did see um, cost increases um, across the building. You'll see some of in there, our steel framing uh, went up by about 30%, ceiling materials, 17%. I won't read all of those to you, but um, some increases across the board. Uh, we compared those to industry, st industry standards of what they're seeing across not just North Carolina, but the country right now around construction, and that's roughly around a 27.8% increase across the system. Um, so pretty comparable for that. We were also able to cut some costs in a few areas, but there are some areas where we just couldn't um, avoid some of the cost because of, of the cost of labor um, and the cost of materials going into the facility. So um, overall, we're seeing across the total uh, increase in the project is roughly going to be about $1.2 million uh, for the interior. That will be amortized within the lease agreement of the facility uh, for the property and for the county. And that will come out, as you see on the slide there, $127,800 a year uh, to be amortized across uh, the lease of that particular program uh, for that. Uh, our attorney uh, will be working with the county's attorney on an updated MOU uh, around the project and the additional costs of the county. And it's my understanding that will be presented at a future commissioner meeting for your review and consideration. And that's uh, my update for today. Any questions? Mr. Kerr. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Roos, uh, I appreciate you bringing up the, uh, the naming uh, the issue about naming the building, mm -hmm. I, I don't think diversion center has a meaning here in this room, and to law enforcement, I don't think it has a, a great meaning to those in need of services. Okay. Um, if I, if you're approaching this from the position of a patient, you know, trying to understand how to name this thing, what what happens in the building? Could you just kind of summarize sure. the things that happen in the building? Yeah, so if you want to look at it this way, is it's almost an alternate to an emergency room for behavioral health. And so that behavioral health urgent care that we talked about component basically operates just like an emergency room does for a hospital. They bring people in, they assess, they evaluate. And just like how an, an emergency room has emergency beds, you know, in your emergency room, there's beds in the urgent care for these people to sit. And there's roughly, I think there are, we have eight beds slated in the facility where people can be triaged. And that's when somebody comes in in crisis and they got a lot going on, sometimes you got to get to get them into a calmer place. You got to settle some things down. You got to figure out what's going on with them. Like, hey, are there, are there some substances at play here that's causing uh, this mania? What's going on? So it's really thinking that as that emergency component. And once they determine like what the needs are there, then they're able to disposition within the facility. And that's where you got hey, this person needs a longer stabilization, you know, like this person's not going to get stable over the next couple of hours and be able to go home with some supports. They're going to need to go in, to an inpatient bed for a week or two. And that's where they'll have actually those inpatient beds within the facility so they can transfer them there. There may be people that come in that say like, hey, this person is really acute. They got some comorbid medical condition going on here. Maybe they have seizures and they really need to be in a medical facility. In those instances, they would triage and they would work to get a bed um, over at the hospital, and that's where that uh, coordination with the hospital is so important. So crisis and emergency are really some keywords uh, for their uh, Commissioner Turner, what's going on. But the other piece outside of that crisis, in my mind, is the magic is what happens after the crisis, and that's all the support somebody needs to stay stable to get that continuing support. So after that crisis, there's recovery groups going on in this facility for people you know, with addiction as well as with mental health uh, recovery. There's peer supports that's going out in the community that are checking on people in their homes, making sure they're taking their medications, providing nurse support, nursing support in the community. If, if um, the family needs support, there's services that are going to go into these families' homes. Um, it's going to connect them with social determinants of health, like maybe they don't have any food in the home. So it's going to connect them with food banks. 
Maybe they don't have any heating in their home. They're going to do that work too to connect them with social determinants. And so I want to say it's crisis is big, but that's just the front end part of what really goes into that long-term support and recovery. So. You started that by saying it's an alternative to the ER for behavioral health. Correct. Do you include substance abuse in the behavioral health term? Yes, sweetie. So when I say behavioral health, I, I mean mental health, substance abuse, and intellectual developmental disability. Um, so this facility will be able to serve um, all of those adults or children. Now, we don't have any child beds in this facility for long term, but for that urgent wraparound crisis evaluation, that we be able to serve <coughs> children and adults for those three disability groups, mental health, substance abuse, intellectual developmental and disability. Ms. Reese, you might want to point out that there are actually, there's a division between the children and the adult section. Yes, yes. So the, uh, the facility, as you see here, is the larger building will, it will include those residential beds that I talked about and all of the crisis services in the two-story building. The one-story building on the far side there is reserved particularly just for children. And so, and that's mainly outpatient and follow-up services. So a child may go into the crisis building if they're in crisis, but once they're dispossessed and stabilized, their ongoing services and supports will be in the smaller building. So they're not in the same building as uh, adults that are maybe in crisis or unstable. And they're very segregated so that the adults and the children don't co-mingle. <coughs> I want to indicate as well, 16 beds. If you go over 16 under state and federal law, you're now a hospital. We don't want to be a hospital. Yeah, there's, so there's, that's why the number yeah. 16 is so important. Yeah, there's regulations that once you go over 16, you're considered an institution of mental disease, an IMD, under federal regulations, and that brings in all kinds of other potential barriers uh, and adjustments. Quick question for the county. We, this may be for another meeting, but are, are there sufficient funds in the opioid settlement payments to cover the additional lease request here? We have about uh, $1.7 I believe, in opioid funds that we've received to date. We are still working out whether or not uh, or what portion of those funds could be used uh, to support the Diversion Center. Our understanding so far is that it would be more for service and program provision and not for uh, infrastructure or lease payments on the facility. So right now I'd have to say that's probably an unlikely source of funds to support these uh, increased costs, but we do have some other maintenance of effort funds. Um, I can't recall if there's any other sources we're looking at for for those funds. So it would be an increase that we would see in your budget for next year. Yeah, let's, let's we'll talk about it for the next meeting. <laughs> 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 Do you have any other questions? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Thompson. Okay. Um, I, you and I have talked, and uh, I, I want to know about security. Mm -hmm. I want to know if security is going to be 24-7 over there because uh, it might not be right now. And I need to know it's going to be 24-7 because that can be a very dangerous population that's going to walk in that door in crisis. Yeah. So uh, initially our plan was is that the, the county would help support mm -hmm. um, security in that facility. I know that there's been some recent meetings with law enforcement where they were sort of taking a step back on whether uh, law enforcement um, would be do that 24-7 and whether that would be a county contribution or whether we would have to bring in a private security um, firm to sort of fill in those gaps. That decision hasn't been completely finalized yet, but the goal is to have security there 24-7. We're hoping that the county and the municipalities of Alamance County will all contribute that to that cost so we do not have to use service dollars to pay for security, which isn't really a ser service, right? And so we're hoping the county municipalities will step in and fill all of those slots. Uh, for us to have 24-7 security, but we do not have um, anything in writing from those mini municipalities yet. Um, well, uh, a patient doesn't come from one street in the county. Right. It's all over the county, exactly. so the whole county 
should support that. And this, that's a must. That's got to be a must. Yes. Um, the pharmacy, is that going to be contracted like a CVS or a, a, what? How's that work? Um, it's basically going to be a, uh, so don't consider this like a, um, somebody just walks in off the street. Yeah. Pharmacy is really a pharmacy, a clinical pharmacy that's just for the providers in that area where right. they can send people basically a Medicaid pharmacy okay. for people with Medicaid. And so um, it'll probably be, um, there's a couple different ones out there. I think RHA is currently using Genoa in their pharmacy and, and we'll probably continue with that contract, at least for now. Our long-term goal would be to explore um, other options for pharmacy where we can try to bring in other options for um, uninsured medication costs. So uh, free clinic type pharmacy or in some areas where we've been able to work with uh, non-for-profits to reclaim meds, mm -hmm. like from nursing homes or other facilities that are just throwing those meds away, uh, working with somebody that can get licensed to do reclaimed meds to bring them to this facility so we can redistribute meds to people that can't really afford them or do not have Medicaid. Okay. Is DSS going to be one of those folks on site? DSS is one of them on our list. We do not have a... a complete agreement, at least I haven't been in the meeting, Sherry's shaking her head over there whether she's heard that. We've requested that they be one of the people um, on site to be part of that conversation. I haven't heard yet whether that staff is funded or how that's going to work yet. Okay. Um, it's really important in this day and time because we have Medicaid expansion starting in less than a month. Yeah. And so our uninsured dollars in our system are very limited. And so we're putting a big push across all of our provider systems and our DSSs to say, hey, we need you to reevaluate all these people that are using state dollars to see if they qualify for Medicaid now, because that's where you start creating sustainability of programming. And so um, the more people we can qualify for Medicaid in this facility, the more services we can add into the program, which just continues to expand, right? Um, what we can do there. The more uninsured people in there, the more we got to use state, federal, county dollars to try to support it. And so, yes, we'd love the, for the county to have DSS there to do those evaluations, qualify for people for Medicaid quickly, and get them moved into services faster. And RHA, um, the Family Justice Center had to get someone to do their mental health crisis, like counseling and that kind of thing. Paige Holderman, I think it is, I met her. Um, are they going to be able to do all of it themselves, RHA? Because it's going to be like their home base, so to speak. They're going to sort of, the way I like to consider these is um, uh, when you're doing a mall, right? You go to the mall and you got a Belk and you got a Dillard's in the mall. They become your anchor stores. And then you have these other boutique stores, right. your foot lockers and stuff that kind of fit in there to really support the overall mall. It's really what we're looking at here is RHA will be the anchor store, the anchor provider um, in the facility, and then we'll be looking to pull other specialty supports and services in to really fill that space out based on the needs of the community. And just curious, are we getting a, a good response from various providers? Because this county's really loaded with people who do great things. Sometimes they don't even know about each other. But I'm just curious, are, are they going to be there full time on site or are they going to be there like a Tuesday uh, every week or something like that? Yeah, it's going to really depend on what the provider's doing and how they're delivering the services, right? Like there's not going to be, you know, there's not space over here for every provider to just have their own right. office, right? And you just sit there 24 7. That's probably not even really efficient for their use of time. But we really want to look to see, like, hey, does, you know, what do you do? And so maybe we have a provider that works really well doing like sex offender right. type work and we need you know that needs to happen twice a week and we'll talk with them around using this conference space twice a week to maybe run a sex offender group or a recovery group within the space so um, one it makes it their use of space they maybe they don't have to have a bunch of offices around the community to do mm -hmm. that they can use centralized space that to some extent is paid for, right, within the lease agreement. RHA will be holding the main lease of the facility, so anybody we bring in uh, next to that is really um, really the icing on the cake, um, as opposed to having secondary, third, you know, having like five or six different agencies, you know, holding separate subleases to the facility. And are you in with talks with ABSS and the other schools that 
I mean, there's a lot of kids got a lot of stuff. A lot of kids went through a lot of stuff being out isolated with COVID. And that just doesn't get fixed the first day you get back in school. Yeah, yeah. The, Suicide rates are off the chart for young people. So I'm just curious, are you getting any kind of agreement with them to pick up their services that well, they may need? Well, we haven't. We don't have an agreement with them. We've had, had some conversations with them. And the school systems are really unique, right? There's this conversation happening with state DPI now, right. Department of Public. Um, institute around what we can do in the schools as far as the public sector behavioral health system and what the schools should be doing on their own as far as behavioral health and so this would definitely be a referral source for schools coming out on their own we're also talking about being able to push some services into the school um, but it really it's a interesting time right now with how those schools are, are managing that so we have an moa with all of our school systems and that mo the maintenance of agreement talks about those pieces in each county being a little different based on what's available in their communities on how they what would be in that moa but as we move forward with alamance county this center would be in that moea agreement and will and it would talk about how they would refer and how they would access those services and supports as part of that agreement um i went to the guilford diversion quote unquote center and um i went all over that place and um we went to one section where there were three children in there and one of them was a girl i think she was maybe about nine or ten years old and the mom had just showed up and dropped her kid off and said i can't do nothing with her mm -hmm. and she'd been basically staying there and mm -hmm. you mentioned about children mm -hmm. what happens with that because there's always that situation as ugly as that is yeah uh, the the challenges with children right now in the system are incredible yeah. uh, we have a lot of children that are very acute with a lot of unique needs and since covid the number of residential treatment facilities for those children has dropped off by 40 yeah. percent so there's high demand low capacity yeah. in the system and so those children are getting stuck at those points of crisis and that's why you're hearing about kids getting stuck in emergency rooms right they don't have anywhere to go or they're getting stuck um, on dss couches because yeah. DSS takes custody of a kid and then they can't find a bed anywhere in North Carolina for that child to go. And so that's where it's a two-pronged approach. This is the crisis part. We also have lots and lots of projects of expanding crisis beds for kids all over the system yeah. um, to where we can try to create enough of those to where if a kid does go in the facility, we have some place to move them to. That process does not move quick through state licensure and, and other rules and regulations. And so hopefully as, as more capacity comes online, those issues won't be as significant, but we're probably still looking at, you know, the next 18 to 24 months of really trying to get through uh, bringing more capacity online before, you know, we see really a drop in those issues. Um, last thing. This is a really big commitment for a county to commit to this population because um, you just don't fix it overnight. I, I wish you did, but you mm -hmm. don't with a lot of other things. And I just heard my county manager talk about these opioid settlement funds are about programming <coughs> and like recovery courts. Mm -hmm. Never going to stop talking about that. Mm -hmm. And all kind of peer support and things like that because the building, just like church, does not fix that you've got to have the programming and i want to make sure we stay really dedicated to programming and not bricks because yeah. people come and go in a building but what we do with them and help them is everything so um yeah i i couldn't agree with you more i, I see this this is really creating the infrastructure yeah. the chamber of commerce really laid it down is you really can't create jobs unless you have the infrastructure in your in your county to really support that okay gets in there with this crisis too is there's only so much you can do with a a storefront mm -hmm. office building for behavioral health right they're not designed to really deal with somebody that's in acute crisis and so if they're not the only infrastructure your county has is an emergency department yeah. or your jails and so it's really creating that infrastructure to where you actually can do the programming that you're talking about in a way that's meaningful and it's not fragmented in so many different places that people get frustrated with the system. I'll be the first time I've been in the system alone. The behavioral health system is very frustrating to navigate and to get what you want. And you would think it should be the easiest, right? When someone's in crisis, they cannot struggle to find out. It's why hospitals 
are so important. They're a beacon in your community. If you got a problem, everyone knows you go to the ED. If you ask probably most of your citizens, where do you go, you know, you know, if you're having a behavioral health crisis, they probably couldn't tell you. Right. Or they would tell you the ED. Mm -hmm. There's really no option. It's really creating the infrastructure to do what you're talking about, but I agree completely. To go to a building and there's nothing there um, at the end of the day doesn't get you where you need to either. Thanks, Don. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Lashley. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think I have a question for um, the county first. Just, just to refresh everyone's memory. Uh, when was the last MOU signed for this project? Do you have that one? Yeah, it was last September. So we're actually 9-2022? That's right. So pretty much 12, 13 months ago. Correct. And what was the term of that lease? Um, 10 so years? the term of the agreement was 10 years. Okay. Just making sure, just making sure everybody's on the same page. When does the AR, AARP funds expire? Uh, we are required to designate those funds by December of 24. So we are, we're inside 13 months for that. So December of 2024. Now, I knew all these things. I just wanted to make sure that everybody else did too. Um, I guess my question is, and I don't know if you can answer this. I'm not even sure if it's, if I should even ask you this question, but I'll put it out there. Because I've had people ask me the same question. So I think it's a valid question. Sure. When you sign an MO, MOU with someone 13, 14 months ago for a direct amount of money, direct lease payment, how can the organization come back to you and demand $1.2 million. The way I look at it, if you didn't do your homework and you're $127,000 a year behind on your lease payment, you should swallow that. My county taxpayer shouldn't swallow it. We signed an agreement 13, 14 months ago for this amount of money to do this. And then here we are 13 months later, we have the people that we signed an agreement with coming back to us and demanding $1.2 million. Now, the reason I use the word demanding is because the county now we're in a situation in which we have our we either have to pull the trigger here or we we'll probably lose it all. I don't like that feeling. I don't like that feeling at all because we had so many options when we started doing this. <clears throat> and the reason I know this uh, these things move along is because when these options were presented to the county on a other on other lands. Uh, uh, there were, uh, Sherry, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we had four, and I think we had uh, up to like 10 million, uh, excuse me, 10 acre properties that we could have pulled the trigger on, and we could have done it ourselves. We could have bought the land, we could have done everything ourselves, but there was a time issue. And that time issue has now come back to bite us in the you know what, because now we're stuck between a rock and a hard spot. If we say no, we can't, we can't afford what you're selling. Thank you, but we can't do it. We're gonna ha we don't have the ability right now unless we get moving in big time fashion to find some land and start doing it ourselves. But that inc incurs some time cost. And when I say it's, it's actually opportunity cost, the time that it's gonna take to get the land, close on it, find a builder to build on it, it could be next year this time and we're still sitting here and we have to get this money spent by next year this time. So the county's in a really bad spot. The taxpayers are in a really bad spot. First of all, my first inclination is, is Alamance County should never have got into this business. Uh, the state of North Carolina showed us a blueprint of why this isn't very good idea is because it's so incredibly expensive. The capital outlay that you have to put into this particular idea is astronomical. And the cost, as we just see, never go down. They're always, in, in, inclination is to go higher at all times. So I guess what my, I guess the reason I said I should not, probably not even got into this, but it just seems like it's, it's all my mind on, on, on this because it seems like the county is being put in a situation in which we can't say no. 
We can't say no, and it's going to cost us multi-millions of dollars going forward. So that's a bad position to be in. It's, you can't say no now because, I, Sherry, I, I think it's almost impossible for us to get this done in the next 13 months. No there we are. So now we have no options, and I'm an options guy. If you have no options, you're toast. You have no, you, you have nowhere you can go. You can't navigate through the minefield because you are the minefield. So I think that's what I'm trying to say is, is why, I guess if I'm, and getting, if I'm talking to the gentleman who started the project, I guess I would ask him this particular question as far as now that I have no options, I'm going to ask him what his options are. Why don't the builder swallow the $127,000 increase rather than my taxpayers? He had an agreement in September of 2022, and we did everything we could to satisfy that agreement. He is the one who did not take care of his side of the bargain. So why can he or they come to us and ask us for $1.2 million over a contract that we signed 14 months ago? No one in this room who would have ever signed a contract with a company to do work for you and then that company comes back to you 13, 14 months later and tells you, you owe me another 27% of what I told you. I don't think anybody in this room would pull the trigger on that and say, absolutely not. And they might even contact a lawyer. But I'm just a layman here. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know if that's true. But I just want to let, I just wanted to say that. That's what's been on my mind ever since I uh, got the presentation that this is going to cost us a an extra $1.2 million when we, we signed the MOU with this organization uh, for 13, 14 months ago. So, but I digress, but uh, I'm just not very happy about not having options. This does not make me feel good at all. Okay. Mr. Lashley, if I may, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, we have worked with VIA over the last year. They, they actually demanded payment um, last year under the lease agreement that we talked about and that you just described. Uh, we, we came to realize that the terms of the MOA as drafted were probably not quite exact enough as to when that lease payment should start. Mm -hmm. So they have worked with us. We have not made any payments at this point under the lease agreement um, or under the MOA. And we had a meeting a few days ago and talked about some of the need for payment after the warm shell was finished this summer. But we have not at this point paid anything to VIA in favor of this lease agreement. And they're working with us to try to redraft some of this to make sure that people understand what obligations are. I understand your concern about the increase in the pricing, and I understand that completely. But they have been a good partner to us in being willing to work with us on the drafting of the agreement to make sure that it meets what we now understand probably should have been argued up front. Could we negotiate with them um, now that we know these things have changed and so the, the county is not swallowing the whole nut here? Uh, when I say that, I mean it like this. If you came with you, were, you had uh, very good intentions to produce what you said you were going to do an MO, MOU, and it didn't occur. Uh, is there any way that, as the county, could we negotiate with this owner of this facility to see if they can help us? Like, why should the county take it all and swallow it all? Why can't the person in the organization? Because, to be honest with you, Rick, the People who own this for 10 years, they make a lot of money. I understand your concern, and we're kind of at arm's length from this process just because of the way we did it. Um, so we're not in a place necessarily to, to directly negotiate with the builder. Okay. But Mr. Roos might be able to clarify the relationship that VIA has with the builder and what they're trying to do to help limit some of the cost overruns. Yeah, we've been working really closely with the builder to try to keep these costs down. Uh, unfortunately, the inflationary cost of building any building in Alamance County or anywhere in the country right now is going up. Um, and, you know, they, they only can do pre-pricing on so much stuff. And so when they quoted the original price for this facility, the upfit, they did it based on square footage costs of the facility at the time they made the quote. Those costs have went up significantly across the system um, since that in initial quote. Um, we'd have to go back to that builder and see um, exactly how they would want to approach that. Well, if, I'm just saying, um, I'm not, I don't, I want, if every, if every, if you made a, if you made a mistake and doing the contract and you didn't dot your eyes, you didn't cross your T's and some things fell through, 
those things happen. Those things are what you have to do is to sort of anticipate that these things could occur and make the adjustments going forward. And when those adjustments aren't made and then you come back, I think it would be incumbent upon the owner to show us good faith to say, hey, look, I made a mistake on giving that MOU. I was under, I was under the market. He should have some downsize to his decision, not just the county taxpayer having to take it all. That's why I'm saying, can we negotiate with this person? And if you want me to come with you, I'll be more than happy. I negotiate my, that's what I do for a living. I will be more than happy to come and talk to him, talk to them, and to see what we could, could do to rectify why everyone can take a little, that's why we have insurance companies. All insurance companies sell, things, sell risk on the market. So each and individual insurance company has a little bit of risk of everybody else's work. This is a prime <laughs> example of what we should do as well. We should at least ask the owner to make some conciliations to us because we didn't present him with the contract. He presented us with the contract. And we went, I know you spent a lot of work on this. So that's why I'm saying we should really talk to the uh, owner of the, uh, the operation here and see if we can get them to make some concessions, considering that I just believe that he is in the wrong here. And when you're in wrong in business, you got to pay the consequences, and it's called writing a check. Mr. Lisha, let me interrupt yes, and ask a question as to that point. Um, as I remember our negotiations 13 months ago, it was for the structure, not for the outfitting. So I think we may be talking about two different numbers altogether. A, I'm sorry to interrupt. There's a number of different things here. So there's multiple agreements, and there's also multiple pots of money that we're talking about for different things. So the agreement between the county was never with the builder of the building. Our agreement is with VIA, and VIA has a lease agreement with the builder. Okay. And, and we saw a copy of that lease, but we didn't necessarily get to weigh in substantially on the terms of the lease. So the, the agreement they entered into with uh, Chadco for the building was, was different and separate from our agreement with VIA. And, and so what I was talking about in terms of the payments are the payments that we are to make to VIA based on our portion sure. of their lease with Chadco. So I, I appreciate your point, and I think you're exactly right. There's got to be a conversation about where to limit cost overruns. Our, our role in that is like the third wheel, as it were. So we don't have a direct relationship with the builder that will sure. allow us to directly sit down and say, hey, we're going to cut this or cut that. But I do think, like we talked about before, VIA is trying to do that, and we're trying to give them input on what we think is most meaningful. We have different pots of money also that are being used as part of the project. So some are the MOE funds. Uh, some are dedicated funds from the state for upfit of the facilities. There's $1.2 in cardinal funds. So there's a lot of confusing elements in terms of what's brought to bear. But we're trying to make sure that we lock down what we're committing to on an ongoing basis as far as our portion of the lease payment. That's okay. the biggest item, I think. All right. Mr. Lash, I apologize. Oh, I'm in good. total agreement mm -hmm. with that. Please continue. No, I'm fine. I'm finished. I'm finished. Thank you for your time. Sure, mm -hmm. of course. Mr. Carter. Well, I think we're all in agreement on that issue, and I, I appreciate Mr. Stevens' comments there and helps put it in perspective about where we stand in that. So, a couple of questions um, and, a, and an observation. Uh, from a security perspective, um, as Ms. Thompson pointed out, um, law enforcement ought to be willing to get involved in this across the board from all agencies because as it stands right now, if a police officer or a deputy sheriff delivers somebody to the emergency room who's under a crisis situation, an officer has to remain with that individual in the emergency room until that individual is released or a bed is found for that individual someplace where they can be held secu under security. So that's tying law enforcement up. So it would be a whole lot easier to have one officer providing security and then being able to call for backup, I would think, if, if that was necessary, than to have um, – they ought to be willing to step up on that. I'm, and I'm sure the sheriff's department will be willing – is already willing to because he's been pushing for this for a long time. Um, Question on the uh, adults and the children. The 16 beds, yes. is, is, is that all-inclusive 16 between the adult and the children's? It would be 16 beds just for adults. So what happens in the children's? Is that a separate entity If then? they needed an inpatient stay, they'd have to be transferred to a different facility. 
So, and right now there's only, I think there's a total of four facility-based crises in the whole state for children. Um, definitely a lack of those as well. Um, so those, those children would either go into a residential treatment program or into an inpatient hospital setting today. As you know, the state of North Carolina is currently working with the University of North Carolina to um, open a new facility up in Vance County. Uh, the, the, they're converting the alcohol and drug treatment center in Vance County to a child facility. And so that will be a relatively close, brand new facility uh, to help support children. So if the 16 beds were not all occupied, could a child be, they can't be put they're, in an adult side at all? They're completely licensed differently with different requirements, and so it's really impossible to mix those populations in the same facility. Okay. I, I thought that's the way it was, but I just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure. Um, specialized care. Now, obviously, you can't have every specialty in okay. the property at all times. Sure. So 24 hours a day, I presume you tie in then specialists who are on call to come in? Yeah, they're going to be on call or maybe referral to a provider that's in the community, right, that has that specialized care. So it's not only being able to have it there, but it's the linking and the coordinating, that warm handoff, which becomes critical, where they may have a peer support specialist that connects that person to um, a specialty provider within the, within the local community. The important thing is that the people in the facility know who all those people are, what they're doing, and how to really access those supports without somebody else having to figure it out, right? Like, we don't walk around with yellow pages anymore, right? <laughs> like, where do you look in your phone book for your sex offender treatment program, wow. right? You, you Google it online and figure it out, and so we really have to have some people that really are not only know what's available, but also aware of all the different things that are happening in the community, support programs, um, nonprofit organizations, in order to make sure people get connected correctly. So what would be the highest level of care capability that would be on site? It would be the 16-bed uh, facility-based crisis uh, facility. So that, that will be, once it gets all the way through licensure, it will be an involuntary, an IVC, involuntary commitment designated facility. And so that's right under, you know, state or hospitalization at a hospital. Okay. Right below that. Okay, that's all I have. First off, as to law enforcement, I would point out the new facility is inside the municipality of Burlington. Mm -hmm. So I think Burlington should have some responsibility and presence on site. Uh, additionally, our good sheriff has been very, very supportive, and I feel comfortable that he will see to it that we have um, security and things of that sort. Um, I assume the Elizabeth Drive facility that, with, that RHA is now utilizing would go away. Correct. So that would be a savings to the county and RHA, and they would move into your facility. So that that's a positive aspect of this. Correct. I know we were, were working with LMS Regional Medical Facility, uh, now Cone, I suppose, whatever goes by today. Hmm. Uh, they were talking about cutting a route through their parking lot uh, from this new facility uh, to straight into the emergency room. Mm -hmm. Is that still a possibility? It's still a possibility. It's been... Um it's not on the forefront of their um, things to do in the next uh, period of time. And so it's, it's been discussed, but we do not have a plan or a timeline for making that happen. It would be awfully easy to do. And you would not have to go back on Kirkpatrick, Huffman we, Mill, or anything else than to transport. We, we agree. Yeah. Or do you have any other questions? And I will say, I think the law enforcement conversation, at least what we're having, has a lot to do with the uh, staffing shortages in law enforcement. Right. They're, they're struggling with maintaining their own staffing, and I think that maybe played into some of the early conversations of what they could commit to. Are you recommending that we do anything today other than intake? We wanted to just bring this information to you. We are working on an amendment to the MOA that will come back before the board for approval once we have gone back and forth between our agencies and 
and have a document that we're asking for approval. And that's being worked on, on as we speak. Yep, we're still working on that. All right. Correct. And we thank you. Okay, absolutely. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. You yeah. I've had a request for a 10 minute break. Yes. So we're going to take a 10 minute break and come right back. Y'all be thanking us. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you today on Medicaid expansion and what expansion means for us as a community. And tell us who, uh, we know who you yes. are. But that's my next TV statement. <laughs> I am Candace Gobel. I'm the director with the Department of Social Services here. I also brought two of our staff members with me today, Danae Pickard. She is our economic division director. And Jamie Hatfield, who is one of our program administrators and works closely with our Medicaid staff. So I'll start just to talk a little bit about expansion and how it come about. We know that this has been a conversation in North Carolina for quite some time now, um, but it hasn't had the momentum that it needed to go before the legislatures and to be passed, which is where we are today. There are currently 39 other states that have signed on to Medicaid expansion, some dating all the way back to 2014, and North Carolina will be the 40th state to expand their Medicaid coverage. It did start out as House Bill 76, which was signed into law on March the 27th of this year. And although it was signed into law, it wasn't quite ready for implementation. There were a few things that were required, such as North Carolina had to present a plan to CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And then of course there was funding that was needed to implement such a big, um, a big initiative. And so it was tied to our budget bill. There was funding that was indicated in House Bill 76 and Section 1.6B, and we will talk a little bit more about that in some future slides. Um, and while the budget bill did um, become law without the governor's signature, prior to it becoming law, the governor did instruct North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services to go ahead and set a go live date. So what that means is that Go Live is set for December the 1st, and that is expanding access to many, many North Carolinians aged 19 to 64. Um, this is a huge population gap that has been missing coverage for quite some time. Many of those individuals that are currently receiving in that population are meeting some of those Medicaid criteria right now, such as having a dependent child in the home, or they have been, been deemed disabled. And so they are estimating that 600,000 North Carolinians will now be eligible for Medicaid coverage. And some in that 600,000 may already be receiving, but will be receiving in a lesser benefit program. And I've listed up here on this slide um, a few of the criteria, such as being a resident of North Carolina, age 19 to 64, being a US citizen, and then of course the household does have to fit within certain income limits. And really just to share more for the public to understand how you can apply for Medicaid, there are multiple ways that you can apply. One of those is online. That's going to the ePass portal um, and having access to be able to do it from your home computer. It comes directly to us at DSS. Um, you can mail in an application. You can come into our office in person or you can call our office by phone. So now I just wanna transition a little bit to talk about our current staff and current workload that we have within the county. Um, we have 41 dedicated staff members who actually determine eligibility for Medicaid in our agency. Some of those are in adult Medicaid programs. Some of those are in more specialized programs like long-term care, CAP, special assistance. Others are in our family and children's Medicaid. And each one of those policies has different criteria to meet eligibility for those. We also have three income maintenance case three income maintenance caseworker threes, which um, offer training services to our staff. They offer quality assurance, which is an important piece as the state does require us to um, take a look at the work that we're doing to ensure the accuracy. Of course, accuracy is important when audits come along because any responsibilities that um, or, or any eligibility that's determined in error, we as a county have the paybacks for that. So it's important to have those quality assurance pieces. And then we have one specifically that does do quality assurance um, as their sole position. So they're reviewing a certain amount of work um, that's being produced by our staff members. And then of course, those all staff members do have to have a supervisor and we have five supervisory positions. 
So on a monthly basis here in Alamance, we generally do take between 500 to 800 Medicaid applications. There are two dispositions that could happen. They're either approved or denied. And both of those generally take the same amount of time because we rely on individuals to return information to us to be able to make that eligibility determination. So after approval, all of those individuals are required to be reevaluated in the first year and then again another year. So we are constantly doing reevaluations of Medicaid programs to determine if those individuals remain eligible for those services. As of September um, of this year, we had 37,872 cases, and within those cases, there were 53,000 beneficiaries. And so you can imagine that households are comprised of multiple people that may receive benefits. So we see the number of beneficiaries are higher than the number of cases because we could have multiple children on a case. We could have a whole family on the case, just depending on when they all applied. Um, based on the totals here in Alamance County, looking at population, around 30% of our residents here are receiving Medicaid benefits. And that might not be full Medicaid benefits. That could be um, some of those partial benefits like family planning services. Um, it could be Medicare premium services, any of those. It just really depends on your eligibility for the Medicaid program. Yes, sir. I have a question. 500 to 800 a month. Mm -hmm. At some time, you would think you would reach a saturation point. Is there repetition in the process? That you would, not, you would think so. Sometimes we do see churn um, where individuals do fall off of Medicaid and reapply. I think what you will see as we move into expansion, we are touching cases that we have previously terminated at an earlier date because they were no longer eligible. Now they are. So that we certainly have... Issues? Um, it could be income. Um, they started a job, stopped a job, started a job, stopped a job. It just really depends okay. on the situation of the household. But we, too, have thought at some point <laughs> we probably wouldn't receive this amount. And it also uh, depends on the amount of uh, or the time of the year. So we have moved into open enrollment. So something that you may not know is with the federal marketplace, anyone that may be eligible for Medicaid, they send that application over to us. So these aren't applications that we take in our agency. They're coming to us from the federal marketplace, and we have to, ter to determine eligibility for them before the next steps can be taken at the federal marketplace. And that occurs all throughout open enrollment, and we see upwards of 1,000 applications that come just from the federal marketplace for us to determine eligibility. We also continue to get calls because folks are wanting to progress further with the federal marketplace, but in, we have to do our due diligence to determine eligibility. So that takes a little bit of time there. This is not all you do, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, can I ask you a yes. hard question? Yes. Not you, but just a hard situation. Yeah. Um, several, several months ago, with the conditions of our border, our southern border, we see a lot of influx of whatever you want to call that. And I had read in the paper where they're going to be, maybe it's through the school system, there was going to be like around 572 new folks coming in on that situation. Is that an automatic Medicaid sign-up situation? Because I know the health department probably has to get vaccines <coughs> if they've never had any kind of vaccinations. I don't think maybe our public, I mean, you have to, you just, it's just overwhelming to know that when someone comes here, if they aren't a citizen of our country yet, right all the stuff we provide they're also children in our schools that may have a language barrier the family has an even bigger language barrier it just kind of just tsunamis so is that population some of that 500 to 800 is that some of that population as well not picking on anybody I'm no uh, i think we have seen some specifically we've seen some of the refugee families mm -hmm. right. that are moving into the county right now That's a um, better word. Thank you. It really depends as far as Medicaid benefits, what type of documentation they have. Mm -hmm. Our policies are very specific as to what asylee, refugee, where they're from, um, just different types of things that we have to look at. And it all is around their qualifi the qualifications that they have um, that are issued through their legal permanent resident card or whatever documentation they have given. Well, I know absolutely no public school can deny any child sure. if they're from Mars. It doesn't matter. Right. But I was just curious how that, that's just, um, that really adds up. It does. And yeah. I know DSS is... Well, you, you had a big plate, that's all I'm going to say. And generally speaking, children under the age of 19 are more than likely going to receive those Medicaid benefits, but the parents may not. Okay. 
But the applicants do have to be citizens of the, of the United States. Correct? So there are Medicaid policies that do allow Medicaid coverage for qualified aliens, but also for even those that are unqualified aliens. It depends on the state of the emergency. And so the hospital may send over an application to us, and there's an outside entity that's a panel of doctors that goes through that emergency situation and determines whether it's a true emergency, and then identifies the dates of service that they will approve and send that back to us, and that's what we have to key into the system. Hmm. Thank okay. you. So I'll also mention that the current workload right now, as many of you have probably heard, a lot of the COVID waivers have went away. And so we are now having to terminate Medicaid cases that we were unable to do so <coughs> early on. Um, so these staff members are not just doing their normal day-to-day -day work, but they are now having to evaluate all of these cases um, that are potentially eligible or ineligible and make changes to those cases based on the situation. And that's known as the continuous coverage unwinding. And so that is one of the pushes that the state has tried to implement Medicaid expansion early on so that counties weren't having to touch these individuals multiple times. Um, but we have had, um, starting in May, to start terminating services to individuals that were no longer eligible, meaning that those individuals will, will be back um, applying for services again what's the difference between that what's that time the in between like if it stops you said it's starting back in May what how much time was there nothing so it would be from June until December 1st okay and so it's kind of like meals on wheels during COVID yeah. we added all these extra bags yeah. and then we have to take them off but they still <laughs> don't sure. stop eating till you go back on that's right so what happens with that so they unfortunately don't receive Medicaid services yeah so you probably don't have nothing wrong with you yeah and I think that's a hard part of our work yeah. because we every day have to turn down services for individuals but as an organization we really do try to have resources available so can we make a referral to the open door clinic can we refer them over to Charles Drew that may have a sliding scale that can accommodate their needs so it's really even though we might not be able to help it's working to identify are there resources in the community that we can refer them and to the health department can play a big part in that especially with mm -hmm. the for vaccinations and yeah. stuff like that okay. for the children Dr. Tony. Yep. <laughs> all right so we'll move forward into the projected workloads and what we're anticipating to see whenever Medicaid expansion is actually implemented on December the 1st I mentioned that there were around 600,000 North Carolinians that would be eligible within the state and what that means for Alamance County is around 16,595 individuals will potentially be eligible for Medicaid expansion 11,733 are estimated to be new applicants here in Alamance County. The remaining are those that are already receiving benefits just in a lesser program. So meaning they may not be able to seek medical care when they're sick, um, but for women it may provide birth control pills. It could provide some of those planned parenthood services that many are in need of. Um, so both of these um, do require extensive effort on behalf of our staff. If you think about 11,000 new applications coming in on December the 1st, that is certainly something that we are um, have a little bit of anxiety about just for the simple fact of being able to process them timely. It also requires us to do a reevaluation of those those. Um, cases so we are currently working our monthly caseloads and now we have to touch those cases that may be eligible I can tell you from the time that the bill was signed we started receiving phone calls about Medicaid expansion so we know that there is a great need within our community to implement it it's just being able to get through the processes of those applications and reevaluations One thing. Candace, because mm -hmm. I don't want to ask y'all forget this. Yeah. This thirty-nine percent that you're talking about does that really correlate with just the reality of our poverty level in this county? So, uh, is it a reflection? So I, I would say possibly. Mm -hmm. I think we have a large population, unfortunately, that don't know what services DSS offers. Right. Um, I've come into contact with a lot of individuals within the county that don't even know where our agency is located. Mm -hmm. So that's really hard. And sometimes there's um, the thought process that DSS is one entity. So if I come in there and share my story, 
yeah. something else could happen. You're going to take my children at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, no. And so that's, that's certainly not the message that we want to share. And anyone that's eligible for these services should come in and apply. So... Um, you stay where your location is yes. for the audience. Yes, we're on 319 North Graham Hopedale Road. Um, for those that are familiar with this, this county for a long time, knows that it's the old county hospital. Um, so it's just located about 10 minutes from here. Yep. Um, and so we generally do see an increase to our Medicaid caseload by about 4%. We're looking, as December the 1st comes, we're looking about a 22% increase to our caseload based on the numbers that they are anticipating. If you'll um, just keep in mind that those are estimates that were provided to us by the state in April of 22. There have been no new estimates provided to us to know exactly what that number will be. We also know that although there are 11,000 eligible individuals, we will probably get far more applications than that just to see if I am eligible for these benefits. And so if our population were to remain the same, this does increase the Medicaid population by about 9%, but we know that our county is continuously growing and that our population will more than likely increase over the next few years. And McKinney Vento with the school system, I would think anybody in that is in this as well. So we would hope yeah. um, that we're getting referrals for that. Um, gotcha. But yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit about implementation challenges. And one of those has been policy. So we received policy on 1023, just about two weeks ago, for Medicaid expansion. And what that means is we have about a month to train our staff to get ready for expansion to actually be implemented. I will tell you that Medicaid policies are very complex. I mentioned earlier that adult Medicaid, family and children's Medicaid, all of those are different policies. So we are now adding another evaluation to our eligibility determination. As I started my career at DSS, I was a trainer many, many years ago in Medicaid, and I used to describe it as trying to fit a square into a circle. <laughs> because you're sitting here looking and shaving off every little bit so you're not eligible for this, but let's look at this. If not this, then what? Um, and some of the charts and graphs that we have described or, or we are given to use are very difficult to read. Um, so we say it usually takes about six to nine months to really train someone to be proficient in Medicaid um, because there's so many if or then or what ifs. Um, there's also no way for us to predict the number of applications that we're going to take in on that December 1st. There's been a lot of conversation around going ahead and applying, but although we say go ahead and apply, we still have a little bit of anxiety about that because of the amount of applications that we're anticipating to get. We do expect an influx initially, and we are currently trying to plan for what happens if 11,000 people show up at the HSC building on December the 1st. So we are working on that. The other challenge is our current workforce versus the number of new applications and redeterminations. It's that balance of making sure that we're meeting the needs of our citizens by um, approving these applications timely. It's also ensuring that they're being done accurately because of course any inaccuracies lead to county paybacks. And as I mentioned before as well, our staff are currently working on this continuous coverage unwinding. We're in open enrollment, in period, open enrollment period. And we also have a, a specific type of Medicaid program that is always reevaluated in December, which adds about 550 cases to our caseload. So we have a perfect storm that's building here where we have a lot of work and a, and a need for staff to be able to do so. Let me interrupt you there. Yeah. The additional staff positions through the Medicaid expansion are paid by the state. That is correct. So we're not talking about money coming out of our county pocket. We're talking about state-funded positions. So I don't know if you would technically deem them state funded, but based on the reimbursement that we received back from the state with the additional monies that were outlined in the House bill, we aren't expecting to have any county portion that would be required for those new staff members. And how many positions and what are the positions that you need 
can make that. Make They're that. in the next few slides if you okay. want me to just hold off and then I'll get to those. But I know two and a half minutes. I think I'm a little over them. <laughs> well, I was kidding about that. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and when I keep looking over here, ladies, I'm so, well, I'm used to looking at the guy behind you and getting his expression. <laughs> okay. I have but but we, we are definitely going to get there. <laughs> So I would just like to highlight a few of the things that the state has implemented in an effort to help the counties. One of those is straight through processing, meaning that our eligibility system, NCFAST, processes directly any applications or redeterminations that are entered through the ePass portal. Um, I will tell you that the percentage statewide is very low for this. If you've ever heard of NCFAST, it doesn't always function as well as they anticipate it to. So that leaves most counties, including ours, to be in the single digit percentages for straight through processing. They do continue to um, alleviate some of the rules within the NCFAST system, and that's all within the Division of Health Benefits, an attempt to allow more of those cases to go through, but we're still seeing very low percentages. The state has also said that all of those individuals that need a reevaluation that are currently receiving, they're gonna process that through NCFAST. I will say I'm a little unsure as to whether or not that will happen. I am very hopeful because that would alleviate a lot off of the county. Um, but there is no guarantee that the county will not have to touch those cases. Is that an AI process versus hands-on or person-to-person? -person? It would. It would be just simply meeting the rules within the system that would pass you through and approve. That means it might not shave off any of those rough edges to fit the square into the round. <laughs> it could. We hope that the policy guidance that's in NC FAST is accurate, though. So. FAST don't mean it's fast. <laughs> that's right. Right. <laughs> um, I will also mention that there has been a push from the Division of um, Health and Human Services to ask legislatures to pass where the federal marketplace can actually approve Medicaid applications. This will not be available to us day one, but that is something that they are working to um, hopefully get implemented that anyone that goes in through the federal marketplace, their eligibility will be deemed um, through the marketplace. Let's see, I will also mention that they have alleviated some of the COVID, or although some of the COVID waivers have went away, they still have a few that have been kept in place to assist counties and that's the voice signatures that we can take applications over the phone and not require a wet signature and also um, the reduction of residency documentation some of the some of the stuff that we had to request it's very difficult and can sometimes discourage someone for applying I don't have all of these things um, when you need two forms of residency sometimes that's hard to get and so they have reduced it to one which greatly helps us out as well does that open the door for fraud? So honestly, no. I mean, any individual can apply. As long as they're a resident of North Carolina, they can apply <coughs> for benefits here. So um, we may have someone that's recently moving here to North Carolina. They just have to prove that they are a North Carolina resident okay. to receive the benefits. So can that be something like a utility bill? Yes, utility bill. Um, and if there is nothing that they have, we can get them to attest. To their residency through a signed declaration. So I'll talk a little bit about the funding in, eight, in House Bill 76 and 1.6b. Um, there was indication that for fiscal year 23 and 24, there was one point, a little over 1.6 million that was allocated per month, every month that Medicaid expansion was implemented. And then as we move into fiscal year 25 and 26, you'll see that per quarter there is an estimated or an amount that is issued um, to counties in the amount of 7.4 million and then 7.8 million. And every year after that, it is based on the consumer price index. So we should expect to see that number increase um, every year. Now that's a total for the state? Total for the state, yes. So I will tell you that um, DHHS has provided county um, financial support. We went to them and said, hey, we need some money to be able to start this, this process. Um, and they were um, willing to upfront some monies to the, to the local counties to be able to start 
infrastructure for technology to start building some new staff um, to do whatever we needed to do as a county to prepare for Alamance we took um, hundred and thirty thousand three hundred and seventy eight dollars that come to us if you remember that was at the end of last fiscal year and there was a budget amendment that right. and it required us to carry it forward and so we have been able to use some of those funds to build some of that infrastructure um, with a looking at kiosk up front that helps bring people in and move them through the process a little bit quicker um, to look at what laptops would be needed for new staff so we have been able to use that um, to the benefit of getting prepared so with those 7.4 7.8 um, all of those allocations for the state the um, DHHS worked to equi equitably send that to the different counties and they come up with a formula that they would use and five the formula is up on the screen so there's a base of five thousand dollars for every county and then it's based on caseload allocation so for alamance we are expected to receive twenty six thousand seventy five dollars and fifty four cents per month for medicaid expansion and then i have put beginning in in um December the seven month totals of 182,000 and then the annual amount as we move into the next fiscal year now as those allocations do increase over the next fiscal years it is anticipated that this formula may change because our Medicaid caseload will be increasing with the onset of Medicaid expansion so that is just a projected amount based on the formula that we know now um, but it could be increasing as we move forward what happens if that number is bigger than what we are thinking to allot all this funds for when it comes to Medicaid? As because far as the never, expenses? You, you never know what's going to come through your door till you finally open it. Because this has been hyped up for so long. Right. There was big controversy, you know, Hatfields and McCoys and General Assembly. And I'm just curious as to what's going to happen when they're all lined up and the last two, sorry, you can't get it. I mean, what do we do? Yeah, and I, I don't know the answer to that, but as far as us, we're going to serve every individual that comes in through our doors, and we're going to determine eligibility for them based on the policies that we've been provided. Okay. Um, so this is the request um, to come before the board today to ask some for some additional positions that will help us with the implementation, and that will help us as we move forward into this increased caseload that we are anticipating. We are asking for eight permanent full-time staff really that's a hybrid model so four permanent right now and then four as a time limited and this just really gives us the opportunity to evaluate the caseload unfortunately what we rely on right now is estimates and what i would really like to see is some good quality data to know what the caseloads are going to look like as we move forward into medicaid expansion and then we're also asking for a IMC3, which is your trainer or lead worker position. Remember, I talked about the quality assurance aspect and the importance of making sure that our work is reviewed. And then as well as a supervisor to um, supervise the staff. Right now, all of our supervisors in economic services have about eight staff members that they are currently working with. And that is really um, a, a big, big ask of them because the amount of work that those individuals are putting out um, so this would be the ask for us you can see I do have the cost of those staff members um, for a seventh month as well as an annual cost and then the anticipated revenue that we would pull in our Medicaid staff members determining eligibility is one of our highest reimbursed positions from the state they come in at 75 percent requiring a county match of 25 percent but we can see that the additional funding that's provided through Medicaid expansion will offset that 25% for these positions. I know in the past, when I was on your board, this was a hard area to feel. This is so not, this is serious. They're all serious. But um, are you still short in that area? And where are these people coming from? <laughs> <laughs> so I will tell you we are competing with all hundred counties for income maintenance caseworkers as we are with other positions within the agency um, we have been very fortunate over the last little bit to work attempt to hire program that has given us the opportunity to bring individuals in on a 500 hour basis and then ultimately at the end of that 500 hours offer them be able to go through the interview process and offer them a position so it um, for some reason the temp 
company was able to find individuals that we weren't but we learned some lessons on interviewing through that um, looking at applications screening applications those that we generally may not have looked at due to their job history it taught us some valuable lessons in working with that um, so right now there were um, 17 vacancies within that department four of those in our food and nutrition and the remaining in Medicaid but we have five, I believe eight individuals that are in the work, so that brings that number down significantly. Um, and honestly, we haven't seen single digit numbers in that area in years. Um, so unfortunately, there is, we are competing with other counties for that. If you look online, every county is hiring for Medicaid staff right now, um, as we are. But um, we continue to work in our community. Um, we have some, um, we do ACC job fairs. We try to get out there because these really are entry level positions into the agency. They don't require the college degree that some of our other positions do. So we really do work to try to get out in the community to share about our postings. And so lastly, I will just share that one of the things that we would like to ask is just some help from our community. And some of that is just to ask for individuals to apply via e-pass. That will cut down on the traffic that's coming into our agency. But we also understand that there is a population that don't use the internet, and that's okay too. We will see them in the office. But we are trying to encourage the, the use of the e-pass to cut down on the traffic that's coming in. We also ask for patience and understanding. We are learning this new policy. As I said, it was released to us about two weeks ago. Um, we have a lot to learn as far as eligibility for Medicaid expansion. With the amount of applications that are coming in, it is likely that there could be delays. And unfortunately, that's the amount of application versus the amount of staff. I'm not sure that we're able to, to do, but we will do our very best. And I will tell you that our staff at the agency Get, become very stressed over overdue applications. They understand the importance of every application that comes through. That application is not a number, it's a person, it's a family. They understand that and they want to make sure that they're doing the best that they absolutely can. So that could result in you, you all receiving calls. Just know um, anytime you want to come over, we're happy to show you the work that we're doing, share the numbers that we're seeing as they're coming through. Um, happy to just share anything about that and know that we will be working as, as hard as we can. I will also throw in about NC Fast 2. It often has latency issues. We see downtimes. We see workarounds that are implemented that sometimes delay processing for us. Um, so we also have to work through that as well. I don't remember seeing in here the starting pay for each of these positions. So the, the amounts that you see on the annual for the income maintenance caseworker three and the supervisor two, that includes their fringe. Um, but for our income maintenance two positions, it's around a little over 40,000. And then I believe the income maintenance caseworker three is about 42. And then the income maintenance social, um, supervisor would be a little bit more than that. I just thought it would be a good idea for the, these folks to your left to have that information possibly and get that out there. It might sure. help you find some people within the sure. county that might be interested in something like that. And so again, the, um, the request of the board is just to consider the positions that we're asking for that may <coughs> assist us in the implementation of Medicaid expansion. And again, I'm happy for any questions that I might be able to answer. And you're talking about really 10 positions. It is 10, 10 positions. Yes, sir. I, I'm not clear exactly how the revenues where the revenues come from. So we've got the state reimbursement, 75, 25, 50, 50. What, what is, briefly, what does that mean? So Medicaid staff to determine eligibility, they pull down 75% reimbursement. So every month we are um, tasked to file the 1571, which is a state report that shows all of our staff, their pay, and also shows all of the expenses that DSS has. So they are, we are allocated 75% based on salary, based on expenses for Medicaid as well. So that 75% pull down simply comes from the day sheet coding of those staff members. So as they're working, they're responsible for coding their time to Medicaid. And then they're also, it pulls down from the payroll that we upload into the 1571. So you're saying that, I'm still not clear. 
and I, I will do my best. So all of our positions are in some way, shape, or form reimbursed from the state. Based on the salary or the it is work. it is twofold. So you have day sheet coding, but you also have the salary that's being reported on the report. So every expense of DSS, including payroll and salary, or payroll and those expenses that we have out, goes to the state, and then they say, okay, based on this, we're going to give you this reimbursement back that comes in at the end of every month. And that's from the state directly to DSS? That's from the state directly to DSS. your bottom line. And then what's the 50-50? The 50-50 is those that are ad admin to Medicaid or provide supervision. So those supervisory position, they aren't directly determining eligibility, but what we see is there's a cost allocation process once those all is uploaded into that 1571 it spreads all of that 75 percent reimbursement across the board so it's an estimate of 50 percent reimbursement for those administrative positions is there some some limit i mean if, if we hired 100 dss workers would the state pay 75 percent of 100 so workers? medicaid funding is it's uncapped so medicaid and, and food and nutrition services we code they pay it back to the county okay and then yeah. what's the what is the additional Medicaid expansion fund? That's just that's the funding that was allocated in House Bill seventy six. Okay. So, so that, that that's per our quarter, of the that is our portion of the state's amount. And is, was there a limit in how many years that's being paid? So the only thing that's outlined in House Bill is every year after fiscal year twenty six would then be determined by the Consumer Price Index, which to me indicates that it is available each year following um, fiscal year 26. Okay, so there's more revenue. Bottom line, there's, we're anticipating more revenue to come to DSS's bottom line than we will spend in salaries. For that is year. correct. Okay. That is correct. Okay, now, that's where I'm having a little bit of a problem. Um, you said it's 75-25. The county's yes. responsible for 25%. Yes. Your chart here is saying, just I'm just going to go to the annual. Uh, Six hundred thousand nine hundred five hundred and five dollars and forty four cents yes. in annual expenditure. Yes. But seven hundred and thirty one thousand six hundred and eighty eight fifty six in revenues. Yes. Are we being are, is that including county funds? Where are we getting? So, no, that additional is coming in from that additional Medicaid expansion money that's being allocated through the House bill. So, in other words, we don't actually have a twenty five percent match. Correct. For these positions. For these I mean, positions. You, you have, you already have a 25% match for okay. our other Medicaid staff. I this just is in addition to the pull down that those, these individuals will pull down right. as they are working through their Medicaid case. So for this piece, the state's basically funding the whole thing of state or feds. That is correct. So why don't we ask for more people? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, no, seriously, if, if, they're, if we're going to get revenues of, in addition to the expense, why would we not have more people to do So I, I do think we're trying to be um, not cautious, but to be mindful of the amount of people that we will need. So we currently have 41 staff members. Right now their caseloads are a little bit higher than what we would like for them to be. Um, but we know that with the additional caseload that will come in through Medicaid expansion, we anticipated the need of around eight staff members. So the excess revenue, can it be used to supplement our 25% match on the other side of the equation? Yes. It all goes to DSS. Yes, I mean, this, question or is that this all question? comes into our Medicaid revenue line that's allocated in our expenditures. So last year, our Medicaid staff pulled in around $2.4 million in revenue for their, for their coding and their salary. Um, so this all goes into our revenues that we report out to our board every month. Okay. Um, that can be seen in our revenue lines as it comes in. We also have state reporting that's provided to us that shows right. the amount that the breakdown of that big lump sum that comes back over to DSS, which is then split into the many different revenue lines. I want to tell you something um, about Medicaid. Um, several months ago, I was contacted about a lady living in her car. She's on Medicaid. She has a very serious illness. The car wouldn't even start. <laughs> It was, I was just a hot mess. I mean, it was just pitiful. And um, she had two dogs. 
and, and like most people, that's her life. And um, Robbie Lennons and Leslie Jones <laughs> were amazing. I cannot thank them enough. And then I had a 20-year-old to show up at my Celebrate Recovery one night, and Ethan Rayner was amazing. So I don't think a lot of people see the real work that DSS does. You just hear the numbers, you hear the staff, Medicaid, state, all that. You really do amazing work. And she's in the house now, let's mobile home, and she's doing well, but um, she's not well, but she's not in her car. There yeah. were so many people that pulled in to get that car fixed, tires. I met so many people in Bronson I, ever, I never knew existed that were willing to step up. Yeah. And um, I can't brag enough on DSS for the work you do that you yeah. never get told. And they'll probably kill me for mentioning their name, but um, I think they need to be saluted because yeah. they're real warriors out there on the street. Yeah. Thank you for that. Hey, Mr. Lashley. Uh, the only question I was going through your pro uh, your per and thank you for your presentation. It was very, very informative. I didn't see any anything in here. What's the income requirements that you say that it's you you, you got in your presentation? You use household, <coughs> yes. And I was just wondering about what that too, Bill. what that what that number is. So I will tell you, it really depends on the Medicaid program that you're require you're applying for. Um, but looking at the increase that we will see from full Medicaid benefits right now for an ind for an uh, individual that may have a dependent child. So let's say you have a mom with three children. The income limit per month is $644. Mm. Very, very small. Yeah. The increase will significantly increase to over $2,000 for a household of three. Still a very, very small. You think about how would someone be able Housing. to support a family um, with a <laughs> paycheck of less than $2,500 a month. Um, but those are the income limits that we're looking for for expansion. I was just curious because I didn't I didn't see it, and yeah. I know that the government like you, when they have limitations I, on. I thought about bringing and showing you the chart. The chart's a full page with about um, eight lines of different Medicaid programs oh, that wow. you have to screen through. Some based on age, just really depends, and that's just for family and childrens. It's much different over in adult Medicaid. You know, those individuals, um, especially with long-term care, they're evaluating trust. They're looking at five years worth of bank statements. Um, there's a lot of difficult work that goes into a Medicaid evaluation. Um, those individuals aren't trained attorneys to look at trust. You know, they're, they um, have never worked in a bank, so to sort through documents like that, it's, it's really something that takes time and experience um, to be able to do. He'd have loved that chart. He's charged. <laughs> <laughs> They're crazy looking I will tell things. you one of our board members actually went through a training at the Social Services Institute and come back just simply amazed at the work that's put into a Medicaid determination. I think he said he would have quit a long time ago if he would have had to do that. But it is a very, very detailed process. Sometimes it's felt to be intrusive. You're asking a lot of questions about your household composition. Who do you claim on your taxes? Yeah. That's a lot of questions that some individuals don't wish to provide, but unfortunately that's the type of information that we do have to receive in order to make that evaluation for Medicaid. So did you say in a household of, I presume four, you're saying that $2,500 would be the maximum they could make in order to qualify? Yes, somewhere around that. Wow. Mm -hmm. You're talking some teachers now. Some Beg your pardon? You may be talking some teachers now. And that, now, I will tell you, we look at gross. Many people feel like you can come in with your net amounts, but it's actually the gross. So all of those things that come out that bring you below the Go level, an AGI number. we're looking at the, the gross amount, your initial pay, not everything that was deducted out. So that's really unfortunate at times and a detriment oh. to some families. Not an AGI number. Not okay. to take home. Right. Yeah. 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 Ms. York. Yes, sir. Are you recommending that we have the four plus four plus supervisor plus trainer? Yes, Candace and point, I discussed and effective this. on what date? Well, we would like to have the positions approved today so that we can go through the process of then advertising and working with the state uh, for the funding on these. So the hybrid approach, as Candace called it, would be to allow four time um, sensitive positions that we would reevaluate based on caseloads just to give us a better sense of what this looks like because it feels like a big estimate projected. 
caseloads right now. So we're really talking about four permanent, four limited, based upon what you Plus just two stated. Additional Plus two additional permanent. Plus the supervisor the trainer. and trainer. Correct. That's All right, I'll make the motion to, do, to approve that. I'll, I'll second it. Or Pam. <laughs> Ms. Thompson I'll, has give me, determined. Give me that one. Thank you. I'll give you that one, Thank Pam. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Any further discussion? I have a quick question. Uh, do you, I'm sure, do you envision any scenarios where the reimbursement is not more than the cost for these additional staffers? I don't think we've been given any reason to believe that that scenario will fold out for us. We do know that we're going through a compensation study, so we may be adjusting some of the pay, but there's still plenty of funding there to cover those salaries. Does this require a budget amendment? It will eventually, yes. Not today, though, because we don't have it in hand. Okay. All right, would you restate the motion, please? can do that uh, we are asking oh I'm sorry I have the wrong let me get back to DSS <coughs> we're asking for um, the board to approve four permanent income maintenance caseworkers two four time limited income maintenance caseworker twos one permanent income maintenance caseworker three and one permanent income maintenance supervisor to support the implementation of Medicaid expansion all right, now I made the motion. Ms. Thompson made the second. Any further discussion? All in favor of signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. But you Thank didn't you. keep it within two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do better okay. next time. <laughs> Given the lunch situation, are you t uh, suggesting we take a break at this point? I will defer no, to got, our clerk. We've got another. We have one more uh, public item. I think we can probably get through that before we head into closed sessions. That might make it, <laughs> it is a logical break. Yes. Oh, it's Iker. <laughs> Here we go. That was right. <laughs> one more item. And ladies, thank you. Keep those crutches for at least a year, Candace. I'm telling you. I think I can take the two and a half minute challenge. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be brief. This is an update on the HVAC and roof assessment process for <coughs> county buildings and ABSS buildings. So what I'm asking today is to authorize the county manager to expend a total amount of $747,829.84. Um, for both those assessment processes and a, be it a corresponding budget amendment uh, to move that from general fund into county capital projects. So the two contracts we've worked out, one with uh, SCI um, and one with REI, that's their, their initial people, engineers, um, they're going to do a complete assessment of all school system roofs and HVACs and all county roofs and HVACs. Um, it's taken a little bit of time because I, I wanted to work through the timing with them. Um, it's a long process to do all of this, and they were all proposing, you know, six to eight months. Um, we've got a budget coming up, so that timeline was tough for us. So what we've done is ask the school system, and, and as a county, we've identified the top 20 projects that we feel like are the most uh, likely to need remediation or to need some work. Um, so we're evaluating those top 20 roofs and top 20 HVAC systems. We'll have that by the end of January so that that can inform our budget process. Uh, there's 83 total buildings. So the remainder of those we'll have done by the end of June, but we'll have the 20 roofs and 20 HVACs available um, for our consideration around budget time. And that I'm presuming is more than we will be able to fund at that time anyway. So. Um, That'll get us the results we need and time to make some good decisions in our budget. Um, and we'll have a complete assessment by the end of the fiscal year. So this will give us a priority list, a timeline for when things need to be done and estimated cost, which we all know is going to be bogus because it keeps going up. Yeah. It'll, yeah the, the, so the, the timeline for, for needs is, yeah, it, it'll give us a prioritization list and then a kind of a level of, of, significance as far as how how bad it is what, what you know how quickly we really need to get on these items 
Um, that's the most important part. The cost, it'll give us a rough estimate, obviously. I had to say that just so if Bill didn't have something. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, it. who knows? So it, it's I appreciate that. <laughs> Tough to predict cost, Had to usurp you someplace there, Bill. <laughs> I appreciate that. Have we done any kind of mold assessment on our own buildings for the county? We've done some air quality tests and have taken care of where there have been some issues at a couple of our buildings, mm -hmm. um, but we are continuing to, to work through those and, and test the air. So as frustrating as what we heard the school system talking about, you know, DPI, you got all this, all this tape, so to speak, of time, you know, how many months, we are seeing the very same situation with months, right? It's just not do it just like that. We've got, it's a process enormously frustrating because do we still have water <coughs> pouring into some of the schools from the faulty roofs that they've got? And I've read about Eastern, huh, that's basically kind of new and they're having some stuff. Is that roofer been contacted about getting his little self back down there and fixing that? So individual roof projects, the school system, where mm -hmm. they, if they have water coming in, we're not waiting to assess that to do anything gotcha. about it. I mean, this, this is not a county uh, project. Our school system is obviously in charge of those, but just working with Greg, I know. But didn't we mention that we were looking at kind of assuming that role or being at least partners with them in a meeting? So partnership is important. I think it's a bigger decision to suggest we're doing more than that. But okay. Right. This is just an assessment study, right? This is giving you the data to feel confident on a plan for priority. So when as a part of this process, I've asked these contractors both just to meet with me on a weekly basis right now. So every okay. week I'm on a Zoom with them and I've asked Greg Hook from the school system to be a part of those. So we're meeting every week just talking about getting this process in place, but also what immediate issues are we seeing? Do we need to do anything right now? So we're well, Not that I need to be in your life more or you in my life more, but could you give us an update on that if it's weekly? because this is probably one of the biggest things we've ever had to do and and we need to know so we can support that sure and i i just want to be clear i i'm even not, if it's nothing yeah it's, it, i got nothing that's okay i think what we're not trying to do in this process is second guess or to supplant right. the school system's job of fixing their roofs right we're just yeah. trying to do with this assessment so that's really what those meetings are centered around but everybody's in a room it gives them a chance to discuss if there's a problem well we are partners we've got to be we're all serving the families no matter right. what and their schools have got to be airtight when it comes to stuff like this because we can't demold once a year unless we all start playing the lottery it's just impossible and we have got to learn massive lessons from this situation and make this right because like Bill's talking about taxpayers it's, it's out of their checkbook that's my checkbook all of us is so I just think it's that important that we all stay up on the same line as far as what's going on. Right, and the deterioration of yeah. the roof or HVAC system doesn't stop during the study. So yeah. I think you'll see at your next meeting, you'll hear from Mr. Hook with a request for some emergency need roofing okay. concerns. And those will continue to come because we're not fixing the roofs right now. We're assessing those. Well, that works against us with time. Time is of the essence and stuff like this. So thank you. Thank goodness for a drought, right? A couple questions, Mr. Chairman. If I might. Yes. Um, briefly, uh, Mr. Breaker, is, is it correct that so it's, it's an analysis of roofs and HVACs that is systematic and comprehensive? Correct. Which is, um, I think, probably new. I mean, to, to be able to take a systematic approach to say, we need to know the status of everything. Um, I think it's important that, that we do that and we do it as quick as we can. And is there a, is there a deadline? You mentioned some priorities that they're looking at. Is, is there a deadline to report back to the county on when those, on what those priorities are? So the priority sites, the top 20 sites, yeah. we have already established what those are. Um, so they're different lists for roofs, different rich for HVACs, and that's just a, where we're going to start the assessment. So once they get into the assessment, right, uh, that's not a final, this is what's got, what's got to be fixed okay. list. This is we need to make some decisions around budget times. Okay. So the report, when do we expect a report from these two individual companies on priorities? So those top 20. On what to do. Not what to assess, but what to. What end, needs end of January, attention. you will have a list of 20 roofs and 20 HVACs prioritized with estimates of cost and what to do. Okay. Now. The, the list of 20, so really 40 projects. 
Yeah, they may be the same site. Some of them are the same sites. Right. Some of them are not, but yeah. And is it is it 20 ABSS facilities, or are there county facilities mixed into the top 20? Are they separate lists or no? So the, the whole assessment is going to be combined eventually. At this point, 19 of them are school systems. Oh, uh, we have one that. county facility on that list Okay. Um, for the first 20. Okay, so we're a full report out by the end of January, but we're going to be receiving information on this analysis as we go. Sure, I'll keep you up to date. I mean, from a prioritization standpoint, they sort of need to look at those all together. And so I wouldn't expect that before the end of January, um, but certainly can keep you abreast of what's been looked at, what some of the problems they're seeing are. Um, we can keep you up to date with and that. And these two companies are working in tandem with ABSS staff in charge of facilities. Absolutely. Yes. Great, thank you. Mr. Carter. No question. Mr. Lashley. I just have one, and it's about the funding. Um, you want to take the 747 out of the general fund. Is it possible that we could use our capital project fund? I mean, we have $10 million sitting there from this COVID stuff. Could we use that? Good point. The revenue replacement funds. You could, could we use it for this situation? I mean, I think it's... You could. I think it's probably a perfect situation to use it for just because of the one-time nature. 19 roofs. And just to let the county folks know that, and I said this to the commissioner board last time, when I, when, when this was t over two years ago because Mr. Haygood was here and we went on a tour. Mm -hmm. And I t had the great afternoon to sit with the maintenance guy for Alamance County. And we talked about a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And this was one of them. He assured me, and he went out and did the assessment, got back to me in eight days, and told me there was one place that needed to be updated in the next five years, and it's across the street. So it makes perfect sense that you come to us, and there's only one of ours and 19 of theirs. We knew that. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, but I just if we can do it out of the, um, the money that we set aside for the COVID, I think this would be, uh, instead of having hit our general fund, because... Uh, this isn't going to be the last time that you come to us asking about hitting the general fund. Promise you that. Yep. So if we could do that, that'd be great. This time, I don't know if we'll be doing it next sure. time. Sure, <laughs> I think it was just the idea that this is also for the schools, and so we were putting it out of fund balance. But if you prefer to do the revenue replacement for the um, well, that's okay too. You're the professional here, so I'm just going to let you direct me to what you believe uh, because there's some things in that um, in the general fund that if we're doing 19 schools 19 roofs for the schools yep. once again we're going to go back to the conversation we had earlier about when you make a mistake you pay for it and this is one of those things um, because I am certain that the 19 roofs that ABSS is concerned about I'm almost certain that two of them were already funded two years ago mm -hmm. I'm almost certain of it I haven't looked at my notes but I'm almost certain of it so if you could maybe direct me to which which account would give this board a little bit more of a leeway to ask for money or not how do I say this yeah. I would say for the for the fees that we're looking at right now for the professional services, general fund would probably be your best option because these would be contracted. We don't in, in, um, anticipate that we would see higher fees use. for these. It would be a one-time use. With the ARP funds, um, we would have to spend those within a certain time frame. And I know that there's been a, quite a few different conversations on how to use that pot of money. So if we get into a to a prospect where we're looking at those funds to possibly help offset some of the roofing costs, then we haven't gone ahead and taken that 700000 when we could use those funds in another area. So you're saying that by taking it out of general fund, it gives us some more options? It gives us some further options when, we're, when we have true cost of what the replacement repair costs are going to be. Yes, sir. Well, thank you. I do appreciate that. Because it does make sense. I'm good. You need a vote on this at this point to um, 
authorize the $747,829.84. Is that correct? As Motion. well as the authority to sign the contract, because that exceeds the authority I would have without a vote of the board. I'll make a motion to approve that. I'll second. Well, we have a motion and a second. That's out of the general fund. For fund balance. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous. I do Thank have you. one question for you, Susan. Yes. Uh, after this goes through the fund balance, can you give us a total of what that fund balance is? Absolutely. Thank you. And percentage, please. Absolutely. Right. We should have our audit. We're finalizing our audit um, this month. Right. Um, so we should have those figures closer to the end of the month that we can then share. Mm -hmm. I will remind the board that fund balance does not become final until the end of this audited fiscal year. But I can let you know the impact. Okay. And you say you'd uh, be done by the end of November? Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. All right, we're going to take a break for lunch. Uh, it is 12.50, roughly. Are we returning roughly at 1.50? That's fine. Quick, quick question, Mr. Chairman. Do we have lunch coming in? Yes. Could we, could we do a closed session over lunch? Uh, the complication is going to be the number of people present, those that are authorized right. and those that are not, and we'll be shifting people in and out during but the But my plate will still be at the table. <laughs> 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 and you can eat it in front of all these people. As long as... I like it. Greg's hungry. That's what I'm saying. As, as long as we're... <laughs> As long as we're all concerned about Mr. Turner only. <laughs> <laughs> okay. oh, that's great. We're, we're adjourned for one hour. Start printing those up. Okay, we're back in session. County manager. Yes, commissioners. Um, attached in your packet, you'll find the first quarter financials. Last time we had the wrong version, so we are up to date for you now. Um, there's a list of highlights there. It includes uh, opioid funding, uh, sales tax, property tax. Uh, both revenue and expenditures are highlighted in that required report. If there are no questions, that's the only thing I had for manager's comments. Are we starting to see any, any positive trends on that? It looked like it was trending up a little bit. On the sales she tax? She said or? since there are no questions. Oh, <laughs> are you talking about sales tax or <laughs> something, else, some other source? Are you talking about sales tax? Right. Um, I mean, it's still very early. This is not a season where One we quarter. see a lot of growth in sales tax next quarter. Back to school, I guess. Yeah, back to school. So it looks like uh, we're about 8% of what we have projected to collect. <clears throat> An increase of 200,000 over last year at this time is what we're seeing. But we're only, we're only looking at two months. That's right. We're one-sixth yeah. one of the way through. Yep. I guess really take a look at it after, like, when you get Christmas and you look at That's February right. numbers. Right. Yeah. And so probably if we do the board retreat again near the start of the calendar year, we'll have some Can we do it in, like, Hilton Head or... Uh, someplace like we, that? We take right direction from the board. <laughs> <laughs> now, where are you I'm having your facetious. chamber? <laughs> I'm, I'm being funny. It's better to have it in state. Nothing. If we're going to go to South Carolina, might as well go to Hawaii, right? <laughs> That's right. It's all other state. Okay, we're through with county manager now. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. Yes, you are welcome. <laughs> uh, commissioner comments? Man, we'll call on you first. I've just, I've just got one that... Um, and it's not, not to, not to trigger anybody, but I know when Bill was talking about the diversion center and how the cost has gone up. I remember mm -hmm. our steal for the high school was 2.5 million additional. You know, it's, it's a shame you can't order everything that day to make sure you're finished and you get it at that price. But um, we were talking about the cost and the taxpayer, and um, 
I know the last meeting I didn't support the um, ACC bond as far as the training center, not the training center, but just the cost of it. And I think a lot of errors were made when it comes to water pressure was silly, but just the timing and all that. And I'd asked Susan about, uh, and Heidi, about some things and like with the issued principal of 15135000 the county taxpayer is going to pay 7.902268.75 over 20 years. That's millions. So it just seems like we just keep taking hit after hit. We got to have stuff, but at the same sense, you know, it's it's just every it's just one thing after another. I know that's government, but that's a lot of money for all of us. All of us are taxpayers to have to think about over 20 years, almost eight million dollars in just districts alone. That's that's the business of it. You guys are, y'all know this, but it's just kind of striking. Mm -hmm. Golly, that's a lot of money. Whew. So, but. I just hope next projects just do them as soundly and quickly as possible and jump on better interest rates if we can. That's it. That's just kind of just, I know we're all mindful of the taxpayer. Mr. Lashley. Um, I just have that one question uh, just about what, in, what, the, what percentage did the teacher raise come through? Mm -hmm. So I got that answer. Uh, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Nothing for me, thank you. Mr. Carter. Mm. I'm good. So am I. Okay. County Attorney. Uh, yes. Good afternoon, Board. I have several closed session motions for you to consider. Uh, the first is pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-31811A4. I would ask the board move into closed session to discuss matters relating to the location or expansion of industries or other businesses in the area served by the public body, including agreement on a tentative list of economic development incentives that may be offered by the public body in negotiations. Further, I would ask the board move into closed session under 143-31811A3 uh, to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body. The attorney will advise the board on ongoing legal matters, including NAACP et al., v. Alamance County et al. Finally, I would ask the board consider moving into closed session to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment or conditions of initial employment for an individual public officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee under 143 dash 318.11 a6 I do not anticipate any action after the closed sessions motion to approve yes. a motion second all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. it's unanimous we are now in closed session <laughs> uh, we're back in session um, do we have a motion to adjourn so moved but we need to announce that we no action was taken well, I think a county attorney indicated that that would happen, and right. in fact, that right. has happened. Okay. Except that we did do a personnel review, and that was very positive. Sure. I'll add that's, that. That's fine. That's all you need to report back. All right. Thank you. Motion Let to me, adjourn. Uh, wait second. just one second. Approach, please. Me? You. <laughs> <laughs> We gave her a 3%. And that came for this. She would help. Yep. We have a motion to adjourn the circuit. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.local govtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. 
Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.